Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's hearing of the City Council Transportation Committee, the last one of, in 2017. Annie Danis Rodriguez, uh, the chairman of this committee. First, let me recognize my colleague who was here, Councilmember Garonic and Reynoso. Today, we are conducting an oversight hearing on the plans the city and the MTA have to deal with the upcoming L train tunnel closure that is necessary in order to do major repairs. Starting April 2019, the tunnel used by the L train between Manhattan and Brooklyn will be closed for 15 months to allow the MTA to complete repairs necessary as a result of Hurricane, Hurricane Sandy. Before I get into this particular topic, I want to take two minutes also to make some recommendation, especially to the MTA, not necessarily to put in a spot for, to answer any question, but uh, I would like to, you know, uh, have our last hearing in 2017 with those recommendations to the MTA and DOT. I believe that as we are in the business to make our public transportation system in New York City the best one in the nation. I hope that the MTA this work and get the support from the state and the city to raise the revenue. I believe that we should definitely get the support from the governor, state legislation in the city to look at the four initiatives that we have on the table, the millionaire taxes, the tolling the bridges, the initiative, a stringer initiative, all those four together can raise $27 billion in the next 10 years. At the same time, I hope that also the MTA should work together to control the cost and with the reorganization of the MTA, I hope to see two seats of the board of the MTA to be designated by the city council. Those are only recommendations that I believe should be considered. I don't expect, again, to get any answer. That's not the topic of today. But I believe it is important to take any moments and opportunity to address the importance that all of us has to make our transportation system in New York City safer and more efficient. I also believe that the MTA should focus from here to 28 only in maintenance and constructions. We should not be looking at any new big mega project, but yet to focus on those two areas so that we should reduce the timing to upgrade the signal system that we have today to 2045. As someone, as someone 52 years old, I will be 80 years old if we follow that schedule. I think that our New Yorkers and more than 50 million tourists, they would like and trust the new leadership of the MTA to get that goal accomplished. Today, again, we will be addressing how disruption of the L train will affect over 400,000 New Yorkers every day. Everyone knows that because the L train does not have nearby lines, the shutdown will be even more disruptive than some of the other similar shutdowns we have, we have seen recently, such as the R train tunnel a couple of years ago. That's why the council and riders expect that the city and the MTA present a comprehensive and detailed plan for getting people where they need to go during these constructions. It will take a lot of work and well-planned coordination to get this done successfully. And we trust the leadership of the MTA and DOT to get it done. It will require extra services on the other subway lines, ferry service, space for bikes and pedestrians, and of course, shuttle buses services across that I hope we will look for electrical buses as the alternative. The Williamburg Bridge will dedicate lanes to keep the buses moving, hopefully, again, electric ones. This shutdown will require for the MTA and the DOT to listen to passengers whose commutes will be disrupted, especially 
those residents who live near by the, these areas affected. I commend my colleagues who represent those areas who have been proactive organizing town hall meetings on these subjects. They also, we had the opportunity to say a few words. We are New Yorkers and we know how to adapt, but we have a strong opinions. We have done so many times, and at the end of the day, when we work together, we get successful projects. However, we need to make sure that the city and the MTA are doing everything they possible can do to help New Yorkers be prepared and to keep everyone both informed and moving. We know a lot of this work and collaboration has been ongoing, and we look forward to hearing more about it today and how the MT and DOT is planning to continue having town hall meetings in the next few weeks and months to explain to the riders their plan. Because of the impact that this shutdown will have, it is also vitally important that this work get done on time. We did it on time, the Mario Cuomo Bridge, we're working on LaGuardia, and we have shown that we can get project on time and on budget. We look forward to hearing more from the MTA about how they plan to make sure that happens. We also know that this closure is a unique opportunity to make important improvements to the airline while the trains aren't, are not running that will benefit L, the L trains riders once the line is fully back in service. We know the MTA plans to complete important work such as installing sun elevators and the subway system first platform door system. We hope to hear more about these plans and what more can be done to make sure we are making the most of this unique opportunity to complete meaningful and beneficial enhancements to the airline. And finally, we cannot forget the many small businesses that will be impacted during this closure and who we need to make sure are supported during that, those constructions and disruptive time for them. Today, we are also hearing resolution 1443, which will call on the governors and the MTA to commit to an expeditious transition to an electric bus fleet and to use electric buses as part of its re replacement services during the L train shut down. Doing what we can to mitigate the impact of this shutdown and the associated plans for travel alternatives on the environmental is important. And I would like to invite a council member Rafael Espinal, who is getting here right now to deliver an opening statement on Resolution 1443. Yes, on time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for holding this very important oversight hearing on the pending L train shutdown. And on my reso, which is calling on the MTA to introduce a 100% bus fleet in the immediate impact area. As a rep of North Brooklyn, this shutdown will inconvenience many of my constituents and will force 200,000 New Yorkers to find alternate routes. More importantly, it will have an impact on our environment. And I say this because an obvious consequence will be more buses and cars on our streets. The MTA is actually estimating up to 30,000 displaced riders will take public buses and not to mention the cabs and personal cars people will resort to. Yet the MTA's response to this crisis has so far been to move those displaced riders by using 200 diesel buses. Just yesterday, they gave us little insight on how those buses will be used. But one important fact that's missing is that we're using new capital dollars to purchase 200 diesel buses at a time when cities across the country are making a commitment to purchase 100% electric buses. The choice to use diesel buses could be disastrous for our environment. Each bus emits carbon, which is equivalent to having 22 cars on our street. And after doing some math, I've estimated 200 buses would be equivalent to putting 4,400 cars in our city roads. And I don't think I'm alone when I say this, that during this day and age, that is unacceptable. The sad irony here 
that the L train shutdown is a direct result of the environmental disasters called by, caused by Hurricane Sandy. So I'm not sure how a solution that would further pollute our environment and clearly contribute to climate change is what the MTA is considering. We must do everything in our power to slow climate change and implement smart progressive strategies to protect our environment and move New Yorkers throughout our city. New York City has already committed to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050. Using electric buses during this shutdown and committing to only buying electric by 2025 will help us reach that goal. I have to note that the MTA did recently announce plans to purchase 10 electric buses for a three-year test run starting in the late 2017, which I applaud this move. Many of us feel, but many of us feel that is not enough. As I mentioned earlier, major cities have committed to go 100% electric, and those cities include Los Angeles, Seattle, London, and Paris, so New York should step up. Making a switch to electric buses goes beyond protecting our environment. It also has a positive impact on New Yorkers' health as well. It's estimated that converting our fleet would, would result in a substantial reduction of emissions that will also result in $100 of health servings per resident per year. New Yorkers would get less sick and save more money because the MTA stood up and decided to use electric buses. These are questions about, these are, there are questions about the cost of these buses, but electric buses cost less to fuel and maintain and last longer than diesel buses. So in the long run, the MTA is saving more money. At a time where we have a federal government being led by climate change deniers, we as a city and a state must develop long-term strategies to, fly, to fight climate change now. I truly believe the L train shutdown is the perfect opportunity to show that we as New Yorkers are committed to resisting federal policies. I urge the MTA and our friends in the states to come up with a plan that utilizes these buses as a more significant part of the replacement strategy and work with us to transition to an all-electric fleet in the near future. Before I wrap up, I really want to give a big thank you to Sierra Club, who's here joining us today and testifying, in particular, Kat Fisher, who's part of the Sierra's Club's Electric Vehicle Initiative for providing information to help draft this resolution and for being a big part of this effort from the beginning. A big thanks also to filmmaker Darren Aronofsky, who's part of the Sierra Club's board and a local resident uh, in a born and raised Brooklyn uh, night and a businessman who has supported this effort uh, throughout uh, the time we've been fighting this. So thank you to the DOT, all the advocates in this room, MTA also for being here. I look forward to hearing your testimony in our future conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Before we proceed, as this is the last full hearing of this committee, a committee of this section, I would like to thank my fellow committee members for all the thoughtful collaboration over the past four years on so many important transportation issues. We have accomplished a lot together. I'm perhaps most proud of the robust series of hearings we have held and the many pieces of legislation we have passed related to Vision Zero, more than 20, making our streets safer for everyone especially pedestrians and cyclists, is so critically important. Every crash and death prevented is meaningful, is meaningful as we have heard the touching stories of family members from Family for Safe Streets who had lost loved ones in traffic crashes and who have been brave enough to share the experience with us. We have also passed important legislation related to city bike, commuter vans, strengthening the taxi industry that I hope the yellow taxi industry will have a role to also be able to provide services in that area that will be affected by the closing of the air trains. Community taxi benefit, accessibility, car sharing, and the for hire vehicle industry, among many other things, not to mention many valuable oversight hearing, hearings on so many issues affecting DOT, TLC, MTA, and even the poor authority. As always, I would like to thank Commissioner DOT, Polly Trumber, for your great leadership and being a partner to make transportation safer and more efficient to the whole city. Thanks to Mayor de Blasio and Speaker Melissa Maverito for their support, uh, and my colleague here, especially the committee staff and my staff at the, in my office, past and present, for all the hard work. There's, of course, a lot more to be done, and I look forward to being a strong voice on all of the important transportation issues we continue to face in the upcoming sections of the Council. I would like to welcome the commissioners, eh, pero primero quiero decir que esta audiencia es muy importante, porque esta audiencia lo que estamos es discutiendo 
cómo el cierre del tren L que afectaría a 400 mil personas todos los días se puede hacer de una forma en la que se preserven los servicios para esas personas que toman el tren, especialmente para los residentes que viven en la parte de Manhattan, en la parte de Brooklyn. I would like to welcome Commissioner Tromberg, Managing Director Hakeem, and the other representatives of DOT and the MTA who are here with us today. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, but before I ask the committee council to administer the information, I would like, and even though my colleague, he also, we had time to ask his question, but he, since he represents a area affected by the L train, I would like also to give the opportunity to Antonio Reynoso to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I am on. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, for your work as well um, in this committee. It's been in a great committee to be a part of for the last four years. And um, what better way to get to the conclusion of, uh, of this term than talking about the apocalypse that everyone's concerned about or the out train shutdown. Um, for me, my main concern is uh, most of my district um, uses the L train as the primary means of transportation outside of the J, M, and Z line. Um, going through these plans that I'm seeing in front of me and the testimony that's coming soon, um, I'm very concerned about the lack of progress we've been able to make on the Brooklyn side regarding um, changes that would help with, uh, in moving my constituents and a lot of the residents of Brooklyn around. The 14th Street and 13th Street um, plans presented to us seem well developed. Um, and it's, it's a stark contrast between what I would consider development on Grant Street or in my district. What I'm hoping to get here today um, is uh, reasoning behind the lack of progress that we've been able to make, what I consider we've been able to make in Brooklyn, um, and speaking to this 400,000 people that are going to be moving, of which most of them move from Brooklyn to Manhattan. Um, so just being able to accommodate them. Uh, so again, I have huge concerns about where Brooklyn stands on this, uh, in this plan, and the lack of communication that I as an elected official have been receiving from DOT and the MTA um, over the last six months is also a concern. Um, I think you're gonna need elected officials to be partners in this process, especially uh, to assist with communication to constituents and riders, um, and I think that we're falling short on being able to do that the right way. Um, so again, I want to thank you, Chair Rodriguez, for hosting this committee meeting. I'm looking forward to asking questions of both the MTA and the Department of Transportation. So thank you very much. Councilman Reynoso, now let's hear a few words from Councilmember Dangarani. Thank you very much, and I'll be very brief. Thank you, uh, Chairman, for this hearing and uh, to the MTA and DOT for, uh, for participating, obviously. Uh, I am going to focus my attention today on the eastern end of the Manhattan part of the L train. Uh, specifically in Stuyvesant Town and Peter Cooper Village. Um, our estimate is about 8,000 residents from Stuyvesant Town and Peter Cooper Village uh, alone uh, use the L train and start at 14th Street um, and First Avenue. Uh, so our concern in that neighborhood is going to be, one, making sure that there is the ability for those 8,000 people to get on a bus um, to uh, head west, but also the sudden uh, development of Stuyvesant Town and Peter Cooper Village as a real locus of activity uh, for all transportation needs to accommodate the shutdown. And that means <clears throat> the ferry terminal, uh, 18th Street and uh, C, 14th Street and 1st Avenue, which is already uh, the busiest uh, SBS uh, stop on the 1st Avenue route and will also be a place uh, to accommodate uh, many of the folks from, uh, from Brooklyn. Uh, we have the 30,000 people who live in that neighborhood uh, already and, of course, the existing construction related to the L train uh, work itself. So uh, I'm concerned about these impacts and uh, we'll be focusing my attention uh, on that subject today. And again, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, I now ask the Committee Council to administer the affirmation and then invite Managing Director Hakeem and then Commissioner Trumbert to deliver their statements, and I know that they're ready to answer our questions. Good morning. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? 
Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Rodriguez and members of the City Council. I'm Ronnie Hakem, the MTA's Managing Director, and I'm joined today by my colleague on my right, Peter Cafiero, who is the Chief of Operations Planning at MTA New York City Transit, as well as some other MTA New York City Transit leadership. I'm pleased today to be sharing my time with Commissioner Polly Trottenberg, New York City's um, Department of Transportation Commissioner. As you may know, MTA and DOT have been collaborating closely since the winter of 2016 when we first announced the need for the Canarsie Tunnel Repair Project. We've been meeting and discussing our plans for this project extensively since then, and both teams have put in a lot of hard work, and I'm proud of our joint efforts to come up with the comprehensive and multi-layered plan, which is what we're here today to discuss. And it continues to be a work in progress. Repairs began this summer and will necessitate the complete closure of the L line between Bedford Avenue in Brooklyn and 8th Avenue and 14th Street in Manhattan, scheduled to begin in April of 2019. We know this will be tough on our city, especially for the 225,000 MTA customers who rely on the L every day to travel between Brooklyn and Manhattan, and not just for them also for the 50,000 customers who travel solely within Manhattan on the L, and really for our entire city and its vitality. That's why, before I describe our robust plans to mitigate this inconvenience, I want to explain exactly why this work is so vitally necessary. As you know, five years ago, our subway system was def devastated by a disaster unlike any of its 113-year history. Superstorm Sandy dumped 7 million gallons of corrosive salt water into the Canarsie Tunnel alone, flooding it end to end. That tunnel was built in 1924 and was not made to withstand that level of flooding. No one thought something like that could ever happen. The salt water caused significant damage to the tube structure. We're seeing deterioration of track and track ties, damage to signals and other electrical equipment. So we simply must make these critical repairs as soon as possible. Toward that end, we're hard at work. We've awarded a contract to rebuild the tunnel through a competitive process. Through this process and its negotiations, we selected a contractor who was able to reduce the tunnel outage time from 18 months to 15 months, which is a significant victory for our customers in our city. We'll continue to minimize the tunnel outage by providing substantial incentives for early completion by that contractor and severe penalties for delays. We're undertaking one of the most extensive community outreach campaigns in the history of the MTA. Since May 2016, we've held about 40 meetings to discuss plans and preparations for this project, large community meetings, public workshops, community board presentations, and these will continue. We'll be out doing more outreach into next year. We're meeting with affected businesses, property owners, building representatives in Brooklyn and Manhattan, and we'll continue to address issues arising from the project. We're working with adjacent properties to do inspections, place equipment, and coordinate deliveries. We've paid for two temporary bus shelter relocations at 14th Street Avenue A and Avenue B to replace those shelters closed due to construction. And we're trying to put graphic banners around the construction with pictures to inform the community of what the stations will look like when we're done. This project involves far more than rebuilding the Canarsie Tunnel. As part of this project, we will renew and improve 14 subway stations along the L line, as well as the G, J, and M lines. Many of these improvements will be focused on increasing station capacity before April 2019, so we can accommodate more customers during the repairs. For example, before tunnel repairs begin, we'll improve capacity at the Marcy Avenue, Broadway Junction, and Metropolitan Avenue stations. We'll add stairs at Court Square and open station entrances at Hughes Street and Metropolitan Avenue. We'll also take advantage of the closure to improve further. We'll add new po power substations and circuit breaker houses to enable two additional L trains per hour to travel along the line to increase capacity. 
will make major capacity and accessibility improvement at Brooklyn's Bedford Avenue station and at Manhattan's First Avenue station. We'll install elevators at both these stations to make them fully accessible while building a completely new entrance at Avenue A in Manhattan. We'll improve customer circulation and capacity also at Union Square by augmenting our, fair, our turnstile capacity and adding a new escalator from the L train platform to the station mezzanine. We'll upgrade all five L stations in Manhattan with improvements such as refurbished stairways, new lighting, painting. We'll revitalize four L line stations in Brooklyn and one in Manhattan at Morgan Avenue, DeKalb, Halsey Street, Bushwick Avenue, Aberdeen Street, and Sixth Avenue. We'll be repairing and replacing wall tiles, columns, platform edges, platforms, and floors. And we'll introduce platform screen doors, similar to those on the air train, as a pilot program on the L's Third Avenue station in Manhattan. Together with New York City, we're working on three categories of mitigations, with added subway service, bus service, and ferries. The best choice for most of our customers will be to connect to an alternate subway service and because our city is extremely lucky to have a redundant and robust subway system. A full 70 to 80 percent of L train customers are expected to replace their trips in part by using other subway lines, which is why we'll increase service on the G, J, M, and Z lines to the every extent possible. For example, we'll lengthen G as well as C trains to increase capacity. We'll bolster M-Line service to run to 96th Street and 2nd Avenue in Manhattan on weekends and overnights. We'll offer free Metro card transfers between the G-Line's Broadway station and the J, M, and Z-Line's Lorimer Street and U Street stations. And we'll offer free Metro card transfers between the number three line's Junius Street Station and the L line's Livonia Avenue Station, as well as between the G and the number seven at Hunters Point Avenue. We're working with New York City's Economic Development Corporation to add a new temporary ferry service. We anticipate that this will be a niche market that will meet the needs of about 5% of the affected L train customers. This service would travel between North 6th Street in Williamsburg and the soon-to-be-constructed Stuyvesant Cove Pier at East 20th Street in Manhattan, where it would connect with the M23 SBS and the new M14 SBS, which I'll discuss more in a moment. During these repairs, we'll provide an unprecedented level of new interborough bus service across the Williamsburg Bridge and across 14th Street in close coordination with DOT. We anticipate that about 15% of affected L train customers will rely on this bus service. We'll add about 200 buses as part of this entire project, and electric buses will be a part of this service. We recently leased all 10 all-electric buses through a pilot program that will bring both fast charging and overnight charging electric buses to city streets by the beginning of next year. This pilot program will, informed the, will inform the planned purchase of 60 more all-electric buses from 2019 to 2021. Fifteen of these buses are currently scheduled for service during the Canarsie Tunnel repairs, and we're actively looking for opportunities to increase that number. We plan to create three new bus routes between Manhattan and Brooklyn over the Williamsburg Bridge during the repairs. In peak hour, we hope to run 70 buses per hour on these routes. To provide this service effectively, we estimate that buses must be able to complete their one-way trips in around 25 minutes or less. We realize that slower times will hinder our ability to provide that frequent service, will increase crowding, and would lengthen loathing times on both buses and at subway stations. So we want to do everything we can to work together so as to avoid making traffic in Manhattan and on the Williamsburg Bridge even worse. And we'll be working closely with DOT to implement street and traffic treatments in order and other forms of traffic demand management. On 14th Street in Manhattan, we'll add M14 select bus service, which is already served by the M14A and the M14D. The M14 SBS, 
will travel between 10th Avenue and a new temporary bus terminal we're building near Stuyvesant Cove, the Ferry Pier, stopping at current Manhattan L train stations. We plan to run the M14 SBS up to 34 trips an hour in each direction, in addition to the M14A's eight trips an hour and the M14D's 12 trips an hour. We estimate that buses should be able to complete river-to-river -river trips in 15 to 20 minutes so as to provide this service effectively and frequently. In order to achieve these times, again, we will continue to collaborate closely with DOT to implement all the surface treatments Commissioner Trottenberg will discuss in a moment. Council members, again, we know this will not be an easy time. Closing this essential tunnel will be a major inconvenience for many of our customers and for our entire city. But we'll deal with it by working to improve L train service as much as possible. We'll get the repairs done. We'll get in and out of the Canarsie Tunnel as fast as possible. And by giving our customers plenty of options, our service and our city will be the stronger for it. Thank you again for inviting me to speak today and, of course, stand ready to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you. Now let's hear from Commissioner Trumber from DOT. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning, Chairman Rodriguez and members of the Transportation Committee. I'm Polly Trottenberg, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Transportation. Commissioner, before we continue, I would like to recognize Council Member Chin, Vaca, Van Bremer, and Levin, who also join us. Sorry. No, no problem. Um, I'm also the city's representative on the MTA board. With me today are Eric Beaton, our Deputy Commissioner for Transportation Planning and Management, and Rami Metal, Director of Strategic Engagement. I'm also very glad to be here today with my colleague and, and partner in this challenge, uh, MTA's Ronnie Hakem. Thank you for inviting us today to testify on behalf of Mayor de Blasio about the city's plans for the 15-month closure of the Canarsie Tunnel starting in April 2019. We all know this closure will be a challenge for the city, the MTA, and the traveling public, be they subway riders, bus riders, drivers, pedestrians, or cyclists. I want to start by saying we're preparing for an extraordinary event. Our traffic engineers and transit planning experts have done extensive modeling, planning, and detailed on-site reviews, as well as numerous public meetings, community board presentations, and open houses. From our analysis, it's abundantly clear that whether we like it or not, hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers will be inconvenienced, including those in communities beyond the immediate areas along the L train corridor. Getting through this will involve sh shared sacrifice for many of us. While we cannot overstate the magnitude of the disruption, we also realize it represents an opportunity to think creatively and be bold. The plans we present today will mitigate a major interruption of service, but they will also support dramatically improved bus operations, make transformative enhancements to cycling in both Lower Manhattan and North Brooklyn, and create extensive new pedestrian spaces. A total of 400,000 daily riders use the L train, 50,000 within Manhattan, 225,000 between Manhattan and Brooklyn, and 125,000 within Brooklyn. At peak hours, the L train carries as many people into Manhattan as all six East River bridges and tunnels together carry in vehicles. The L train carries as many people into Manhattan as the entire Long Island Railroad. The 50,000 who use the L train to travel solely within Manhattan along 14th Street is a larger ridership than any single bus route in the city and 61% greater than the M14's current daily ridership of 31,000. One thing we know is that nothing matches the efficiency of the subway system, and as the MTA has laid out, alternative subway routes will carry 70 to 80 percent of the displaced L train riders needing to enter Manhattan from Brooklyn. At the same time, MTA buses will carry up to 15 percent of affected commuters coming into Manhattan and along 14th Street. Additional ferry service will carry up to 5 percent, and we expect 1 to 2 percent of affected commuters to cycle. While alternative subways may be crowded, they will provide the best option for most travelers. However, we both know a reliable bus ride into Manhattan will also be critical for those whom taking the subway is infeasible, and buses will be necessary to relieve some of the pressure on the subway system overall. Even though subways will absorb the large majorities of displaced riders, we will require transformative steps to move tens of thousands of commuters by bus. To visualize and understand everything we're proposing, we thought it best to look at our plan changes by affected community. As the longest crosstown street in Manhattan, from the Whitney Museum to Stytown, 14th Street is a vibrant mix of cultural, retail, educational, and health institutions, along with dozens of residential buildings. It's a bustling hub of activity, fueled in part by the mobility the L train has provided since its first opened 93 years ago. 
The 50,000 Manhattan-only L train riders will need a reliable above-ground replacement. As a result, DOT will implement bus service improvements and protected bike lanes, and we will need to dramatically increase sidewalk space to prevent pedestrians from dangerously spilling onto the street. To support dramatically enhanced bus service and provide relief for acute pedestrian crowding, DOT plans to implement a busway that will be exclusively for buses during rush hour in a core zone, as well as 24-7 dedicated red bus lanes all along 14th Street. And as announced by the mayor in October, we'll be bringing Select Bus Service to 14th Street as part of this effort. Select Bus Service has already proven successful in increasing ridership and reducing travel times on three other crosstown Manhattan routes. As you can see, well, actually, you can see from the rendering behind me, this will be an SBS, that rendering, an SBS upgrade plus that will include temporary bus bulbs, sidewalk expansion, and improved station elements at the stops. Bus stops will be offset out of the travel lane with commercial loading zones in between. Applying this busway treatment to a core zone between 3rd and 8th Avenues traveling westbound and between 9th and 3rd Avenues traveling eastbound will help us meet the targets the MTA has set for bus travel times while, minimi while minimizing choke points and traffic spillover that would be caused by a busway treatment for the full length of 14th Street river to river. The 14th Street busway will require focused focus bus lane enforcement. DOT is working with NYPD on an enforcement plan and also hopes to rely on automated bus lane enforcement. Our working plan is to allow access ride at all times, allow access to the three garages on 14th Street, and limit deliveries during rush hours. But we intend to work closely with local elected officials, community boards, businesses, major institutions, bids, and the Taxi and Limousine Commission to further refine our plan. We are also focused on providing the best possible bike connection along this corridor, as we expect demand for cycling will double as a result of the closure. We've concluded that the sheer volume of buses that will be on 14th Street and the need for expanded pedestrian space will not mix well with the high cyclist volume we expect. Therefore, as you can see from the rendering behind me, we'll be adding Manhattan's first protected two-way crosstown bike lane along 13th Street from Avenue C to 9th Ave. This change will help us meet the demand for cycling, which was growing even without the L train closure, safely and with fewer conflicts. To accommodate the necessary redesign of 13th and 14th Streets, DOT will repurpose approximately 300 metered parking spaces on 14th Street and a mix of about 250 metered and non metered parking spaces on the south curb of 13th Street. At the same time, we're proposing to add 75 new commercial loading spots on 14th Street. Since we expect crosstown cycling and walking to increase, increase dramatically as an alternative to the L train, we're proposing other exciting public space improvements on repurposed roadbed on Union Square West and University Place. On Union Square West, we'll maintain a service loop between East 16 and East 15th Streets while closing the blocks between East 17th and East 16th and East 15th and East 14th for new pedestrian space in an area that is right now typically filled with pedestrians. On University Place between East 13th and 14th, we will create bike parking with potentially expanded city bike capacity, a bike parking concession kiosk, and several bike corrals along with new pedestrian space. We will also explore various options to enhance secure and in some cases weather protected bike parking options for private bicycles along the corridor using temporary structured lease space and innovative partnerships. In our plans, we'll complement 13th Street's new protected bike lane with upgraded infrastructure along East 20th Street to ensure a safe and convenient cycling route to connect the Stuyvesant Cone Ferry Landing and the East River Greenway to our protected bike lanes on 1st and 2nd Avenues. We're also looking at ways to improve pedestrian crossings and boarding areas for ferry passengers connecting with the bus. On Delancey Street on the Lower East Side, we'll bring long-awaited improvements that create a direct protected bike link between Allen Street and the Williamsburg Bridge, as well as an eastbound connection from Christie Street. Together, these new bike lanes will create a, a high-quality protected bicycle route all the way from Brooklyn to 14th Street in Manhattan while calming traffic and reducing bike and pedestrian conflicts. Keeping 14th Street and other crosstown streets in Manhattan in motion is only our first challenge. The L train closure will put a tremendous strain on the Williamsburg Bridge. When it comes to getting New Yorkers over the bridge, we've looked at a range of options. We project that MTA buses will need to serve about 30,000 riders per day, or the equivalent of 25 packed L trains. And we need to take aggressive action if our crowded streets and bridges are going to handle this surge of buses. If we were to make no changes to our streets to efficiently move buses, they would simply not be a reliable alternative option. 
We would expect to see severe overcrowding on our subway lines and worsening congestion in Midtown, Williamsburg, and near the approaches of all our East River crossings as transit riders shifted to taxis and other services. From DOT's side, our goal is to make sure that New Yorkers who are traveling by bus over the Williamsburg Bridge will have travel times that are as fast and reliable as possible. At the same time, we want to minimize congestion caused by these changes, both in Williamsburg and around the city. To this end, DOT will create a set of dedicated bus lanes that connect from the Grand Street L train station and along Roebling Street, across the Williamsburg Bridge, and onto Delancey Street and other key locations in Manhattan. Note that I said Grand Street, which is not the closest Brooklyn L train station to Manhattan, but will be the best connection to buses headed over the Williamsburg Bridge. Once those buses get to the 114-year-old Williamsburg Bridge, the narrow lanes mean that buses and trucks will need to share this space. We are also evaluating how best to handle car traffic bound for Clinton Street in Manhattan, which may also need to use the outer deck of the Williamsburg Bridge so as not to delay buses with late merging behavior. We will handle the increased demand for the Williamsburg Bridge through the imposition of high occupancy vehicle restrictions of a minimum of three people during rush hour, together with bus lanes on the approach spans and along the L alternative bus routes on both sides of the bridge. This will permit buses to move reliably over the Williamsburg Bridge. We don't make these plans in a vacuum. We have some experience with HOV restrictions in the past, after September 11th, during the 2005 subway strike, and in the aftermath of Superstorm Sandy. And we prepared for such restrictions again in anticipation of a Long Island Railroad strike in 2014. HOV restrictions are complex. We will need to facilitate pickup zones that allow for the safe and efficient loading of passengers by both private and for hire vehicles, create clear signage, and communicate understandable travel options and regulations for affected commuters. When it comes to enforcement of restrictions, such as those that will be needed for the Williamsburg Bridge, the city will seek temporary state authorization for additional automated bus lane enhancement. And as always, we'd welcome the support of our elected officials to help win this authorization in Albany. We anticipate that some L-Train riders will choose rideshare services as either their main mode or to connect to another mode. DOT will work with our partners at the TLC wherever possible to encourage high occupancy tax taxi and FHV services that improve overall mobility, but without duplicating mass transit or interfering with the MTA's critical replacement bus services. Finally, I want to caution that our modeling shows that with new HOV restrictions on the Williamsburg Bridge, significant traffic will shift to other East River crossings and approaches, potentially causing significant backups. And these backups would not just be on our highways. They would have a direct effect on Queens Boulevard, Tillery Street, Flatbush Avenue, and other streets miles away many of which are already heavily congested during peak hours. We will continue to analyze this issue and will be engaging in further discussions about the bridges. Now I want to further discuss our work in Brooklyn, where we've made major improvements already for bus riders, pedestrians, and cyclists, and more are on the way. As with much of our work on the Manhattan side, Brooklynites will also benefit from these operational and safety improvements long after the L train returns in 2020. Those of you who've been in Williamsburg lately know that working closely with the MTA, DOT has made improvements to the B44 SBS bus terminus there, including major sidewalk upgrades. We have a lot of other plans for nearby areas. With 7,000 cyclists per day, the Williamsburg Bridge is already the busiest East River crossing for cycling. By once again using our Sandy experience as a guide, we can reasonably expect daily bicycle volume to double during the L train closure. To improve bike and pedestrian access to and from the Williamsburg Bridge and as part of our record 25 miles of protected bike lanes in 2014, we recently added protected bike lanes at Brinkwin Place, South 4th and South 5th Streets, linking to the existing bike network in Williamsburg. We also recently added new routes on Shoal Street and Meserol Street to improve access deeper into Bushwick. These new projects lay the groundwork for further enhancements to the neighborhood network to provide a direct bike route in Brooklyn for cyclists headed to the Williamsburg Bridge. Getting Grand Street right will be important, and I will say it is going to be one of our biggest challenges. This street serves at once as a critical map truck route connecting the North Brooklyn IBZ with the Williamsburg Bridge, a thriving commercial corridor, a bus corridor for the Q54 and Q59, and a major bike route. Our plan for Grand Street will have to balance all of these needs, but it will include new protections for cyclists and dedicated spaces for buses to accommodate the L alternative buses and the growth in cycling we anticipate. We've mentioned the critical role of the Williamsburg Bridge as an alternative bus and cycling route for L riders, but by far most New Yorkers who use this bridge will be those taking the JM and Z trains. We're preparing to ensure that the corridor along Broadway and Myrtle, where this elevated line runs, can safely accommodate the influx of pedestrians and cyclists arriving to take the train in South Williamsburg and Bushwick. We'll be installing new crosswalks and curb extensions, 
bike parking, and expanded pedestrian space. And we're studying street design and traffic controls, controls to reduce conflicts, shorten crossings, and create simpler, safer turns. Likewise, we'll make street improvements around the Nassau Avenue G train station in Greenpoint. As you've heard, like the JMZ, the G is expected to see a big increase in ridership, and we will create shorter, safer, more direct crossings to the train. To maximize our investments in these new bike lanes, DOT will be working to expand bike parking in areas where we expect cyclists may transfer modes, especially from bike to subway. I mentioned expanded bike parking in Union Square earlier, but we're also looking at robust new, robust new bike parking facilities near stations at both ends of the Williamsburg Bridge. We also look forward to working with our partners at Motivate to enhance city bikes' capacity to serve displaced L riders. City bike improvements might include robust valet services to move riders along the L train, cross down corridor, and disperse them from bus drop-off points in Manhattan, as well as increased capacity and bicycles in Brooklyn and throughout the system. I'd like to conclude by saying there's no question Hurricane Sandy dealt us all a tough hand, and as we of the MTA have done our analysis, we've, been, we've become convinced that many New Yorkers will be affected even though they may not realize it yet, whether on the roads they travel, the buses or trains they now ride on, that we'll see an influx of L train riders. I want to commend the very talented and dedicated DOT and MTA staffs for their hard work and creativity in putting this ambitious plan together. And I know our agencies will continue to be strong partners on behalf of the traveling public as we face the challenge of the Canarsie Tunnel closure. We will be jointly conducting a significant new round of public outreach on these plans in January and February of the coming year. We will be seeking input from all the elected officials, community boards, businesses, civic groups, institutions, and everyday New Yorkers. We will need your help as we finalize our plans and make tough decisions. But we also tend to stay on track to make the changes I've just described over the course of the year ahead. This will be important to give us a chance to work out any kinks and deliver some great mobility and safety improvements. Understanding, some of, understanding that some of this timing may change, we plan to install bike lanes on Delancey Street this spring. The treatments on 13th Street, 14th Street, and on Grand Street in Brooklyn will be installed in late summer or early fall and SBS on 14th Street will commence in late 2018 or early 2019. I want to thank you for inviting me to testify today. Happy to take questions. And in closing, I just wanted to thank you too, Mr. Chairman, as we reflect on the four years of uh, working together on this committee. It's been a real pleasure, and thank you. I think we have accomplished a lot of terrific things with Vision Zero and a lot of the other transportation work we've done together. So thank you and the committee. Thank you. And both NTA and DOT be ready for our third car-free day, Sunday, April 22nd. <laughs> You've been great part in the, in the two previous ones. Uh, my colleagues, they have questions. I also want to recognize Councilmember Menchaca, Johnson Dodge, and Greenfield, who was here. I have many questions, but I'm going to be asking a few, since my colleagues also have many other questions. Uh, To the MTA, uh, who is the private contractor and does that company or corporation has a history of finishing projects on time? Yes, the uh, contractor is the D Judlau contractor who is the same contractor that also worked on the Montague Street tube, which was done on time and budget. What is their history beside the projects? Uh, on this kind of work, quite, quite good. Um, we are in the process right now of working on trying to get them to accelerate some work they're doing at the Cortland Street Station, but otherwise we have a good track record with them. Okay. Are they using like the sign bill as part of finishing the project on time and, and reducing the cost of the project? This, this project was actually fully designed, but ultimately through negotiations they brought a lot of innovation in terms of how they're going to go about doing the work. Um, the cost of the contract is um, about $477 million. That contract includes an incentive provision, which was negotiated with the contractor to see if they can reduce the outage period by up to two months. And in the event that they succeed in doing that, we would pay a premium for that, and we're prepared to pay a premium for that, of another $15 million. When is a month of completion for this project? It, the closure starts in April of 2019. It goes for currently 15 months, and so it would be mid-2020. What is a month? Uh, One month of 2020. Uh, Ju July of 2020. So July 2020, okay, everyone, all New Yorkers, okay? You know, we need to be sure we have seen 
Tampa Sea Bridge, Bill on Time. We have seen LaGuardia, LaGuardia being major renovation, expected to be on time. We have seen UPK in the city. We have seen many projects. So everyone expect for both MTA and DOT to be sure that by July 2020, this project is complete. So for me, more than the details and the logistics, I trust the new leadership of the MTA and the DOT. I know that we are starting on time, but more concern, my concern is also to be sure that we also finish by the month and the year, and we don't get delayed so, uh, on this project. Uh, what are we doing with the small businesses? They need a lot of support, right? They are going to need support, and I think particularly, you know, we've been in communication with both the businesses in, in North Brooklyn and those along 14th Street, and uh, our um, the city's small business commissioner, Greg Bishop, has and his team have been a part of our meetings, and I think going forward in this coming year, they're going to be part of our continued outreach, and we're going to use every tool at the city's disposal. I think the one thing that I have certainly heard from bids and small businesses is you know, as we sort of to add to our challenges as we are accommodating buses and cycling and pedestrians, can we make sure that they can get their deliveries, that their businesses can continue to operate? And so th that's some of the, I think, the fine-grained things we're going to have to work through in this outreach period. Mm -hmm. What role will Connect play in the whole renovation of the L train? Con Edison, um, there's a, a significant utility uh, portion of this work. Some of that work is already underway, and so Con Edison will also be one of the partners that we'll be working with. Is that a separate contract to Con Ed, or is part of the contractor who award this contract to work as a subcontract with Con Ed? Most of the work Con Edison works, and they do themselves. They do contract a little bit out. We pay them for that work. What, what is the budget that the, the MTAs have for connect. The utility the budget um, is approximately fifteen million dollars. Fifteen. Yes. Yeah. Uh, was there any possibility when you look at this project to? And again, I'm not the engineer, so I don't know the detail. We, do you look at any time to run like a shuttle train to focus first on the reconstruction of the tunnels? and be able to have sh this L train continue running as a shuttle train from Brooklyn up to the river and the same thing from Manhattan? So between the, the terminus at Rockaway Parkway, Canarsie, up to Bedford, there are approximately 125,000 people who use that service exclusively in Brooklyn today. They will continue to have the same type of service during the shutdown period. The, the choice that we made was one that was informed by a lot of community interaction about not running one track at a time and having to have the closure be more than twice what it was anticipated to be, 36 months. Everybody said to us wholeheartedly, bring it down, do it all at once, get it done, get, get it done right, and reduce the level of impact, the time of that impact. So initially, we thought 18 months was going to be the, the closure. And in negotiating with this contractor, we're able to bring it down to 15 months that we're looking at today. Okay. Have the city look on how the requirement, and I'm all about you know, putting as many passengers as possible in, in taxis. But have they, did the city look at how the yellow taxi that has been hurt big time the last couple of years be able to be part of the providers of the services as the requirement is going to be like three passenger per, per we, we certainly have taken a look at that and we are going to be working closely with the TLC. Um, look, one, one thing I think we feel strongly about on the Williamsburg Bridge, those HOV restrictions, but we want to very much use facility and apps to help connect drivers with potential passengers. And there are examples in other parts of the country where they're called slug lines, where cars can come and pick up passengers. We want to try and find some of those places. I think we'll be working with, with local council members to identify some potential sites to do that. Uh, you know, we, we recognize that, that cabs and, and FHVs are going to play a role here, but we do also recognize, again, to facilitate the kind of bus movements we need, the growth we're going to see in cycling, we are going to have to manage that piece of the traffic very carefully. I just would like to encourage, you know, you as a leader in this process, especially working with TLC, 
to look and bring to the table the yellow taxi industry because, you know, what I'm getting right now is email from those medallion owners, especially the 6,000 individual medallion owners that they don't know what to do with the medallion because of the whole crisis that is affecting their industry. So as I know that the Uber and Lyft and the other app company, they are waiting to take advantage of the opportunity that this uh, closure of the train will provide for them. I just want to be sure that everyone get to get opportunity also to provide the services there. Is that something that we agree to? Yeah, yeah again, we're gonna work with the TLC on that. And, and as you know, now the, the, the taxi industry has got their own app, they've got Curb. They, I think they're starting to have the kind of technologies that will hopefully enable them to be able to pick up multiple passengers and participate in the, in the HOV and the other changes we're making. Okay, when the, the bike lane, like in, you, you refer to, you mentioned uh, there's gonna be some area in the Manhattan side that is gonna be protected, expanding the protected bike lane. Do you look at making most of the bike lane in the whole area of the closure protected bike lane? I mean, our goal is, and I, I'm, I'm pretty sure we're going to accomplish it, to have protected bike lanes that run from the key parts of Bushwick and Williamsburg where people will be getting off the L train, getting off of buses that will take you over the Williamsburg Bridge, connect along Delancey Street to the major bike routes in Manhattan. And you know, you see we've, we've fleshed out the piece on 13th Street, as I just talked to the council member quickly about the Williamsburg piece before the hearing. We, we're gonna be having protected infrastructure on Grand Street. I think that's the one part I will admit. I hear some frustration that we still need to work through some details on the design and potentially where some of the other bike lanes are going to be in Williamsburg. But as I mentioned in my testimony, for the past couple of years, we have been working very aggressively to build out a bike network further into Williamsburg, into Bushwick. We've improved the connections on the Brooklyn side of the Williamsburg Bridge and in the spring, we'll be doing work on the Delancey Street side. So. I think we will have a very robust protected network that will take you throughout all the places you need to go in Brooklyn on into all the connections in Manhattan. Yeah, and, and with the, my last question, and then I will call on my colleagues who ask a question, is about the bus services. Like, will we see new buses? Will those buses be electric? What yeah. like? Yes, we're in the process of procuring new buses that idea would be for the supplement for the majority of those 200 buses to be new buses we anxiously are looking forward to the pilot program that we're about to kick off on the all electric bus to see how successful that can be and become part of our strategy as well okay i saw that and and i assume that the services there will be as again as we will have the taxis and i hold again in those services for the yellow to be a major player in that, providing those services. When it comes to buses, do we anticipate that most all buses to be providing services will be Rep. TW members? Yes, I think that's correct, sir. Okay. They, they'll be part of our, our MTA, New York City Transit bus fleet. Okay, I just hope again that, as I have seen, it looked as on a vehicle company, they're doing contracts with some of those new taxi industry and trying to bring new services, taking you know, advantage and opportunity of transportation deserts that we have in the city, that in this particular area, we focus on the services that we are right now, especially with the bus services. I hope for the TW to be the one who provide those services there. Yes, all of our bus service is represented by the majority by the TWU with some ATU representation as well, but it's all represented service. No, I, I understand that all the MTA buses are represented by the TWU. What I'm saying is that I just hope to see an increase of those buses and not being short with the number. So others will come and take advantage. For me, I'm all about New York City provide opportunity for everyone to do well. Yeah. But when it came to the public transportation, my main focus is to support those services represented by TW. Yes. Great. Thank you. Uh, Council since he has a resolution, and then followed by Councilmember Garani and Reynoso. Thank you. That's so kind of you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Uh, and thank you, MTA, for being here. I really appreciate uh, you being here and um, uh, being able to give testimony on the issue. So I just want to get back on, on the buses. Um, has the MTA ever purchased, um, used, or even tried electric buses on our city streets? No, I'm, I'm joined by Craig Cipriano, a, a senior leader in the Department of Buses. But we have been um, at the forefront of some new technology, whether it was the in, in implementation of compressed natural gas, new ultra-low sulfur diesel fuel, and now moving into the electric bus um, realm. Yeah, we had some uh, test buses on loan for a short period of time, uh, a year or so ago. And as you know, we have 10 test buses that were anxiously uh, waiting to uh, pilot uh, in 2018. And we're looking to learn from that pilot to inform you know, the L-line closure and what we can do. So what is the hesitation of, of purchasing more than 10 buses? Uh, we, other cities across the country, other cities across the globe, have hundreds if not thousands of buses operating and working well. You know, the MTA, I'm sure, can learn from that. What is the hesitation of putting these buses on our streets as soon as possible? We think that uh, taking the approach of piloting initially both in Brooklyn and Manhattan will give us a good sense of the viability of these buses. You know, what we don't want to do is make a mistake. Um, these are expensive investments that we're making and will continue to make and think that there, there is an opportunity here. We just have to confirm it, work on it, may then work with the manufacturers of these buses to meet our needs. We, we have a year and a half till, till the closure of the L train. Um, isn't a year enough time to get a bus out in January and just see how they're working by, by, by 2019? We hope to have a, a good sense in 2018 how these buses are working. Absolutely. That's why we're looking forward to putting them on the streets as quickly as possible in, in the next several weeks. Uh, so the, has the, so the, is the MTA fully committed to purchasing 200 diesel-run buses? Because I know back in, in, back in August 2016, the board did approve to purchase those buses. The, the purchase of the 200 buses as part of the initial plan was to proceed with the purchase of um, diesel buses. We are planning on adding, hoping that the pilot works well, more all-electric buses to our bus fleet as well. And if we are able to mix up the number, we will certainly take a hard look at that and try to push as much clean technology as possible. What, what is the average lifespan of a diesel bus? Uh, we plan for a 12-year useful life of our bus. 12 years. So, so these 12 these these 12 year buses that we're going to, that the MTA is going to purchase will be on our streets of 2030, 2031, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, approximately. I, I just I just feel that uh, we as a city and as a state should be leading this conversation. You know, LA and Seattle have committed to going 100% electric by 2025 to 2030. But what, we, what we're hearing here is that by 2031, we will still have diesel buses on our New York City roads. You know? and, I, and I think this, that, that New Yorkers should know that this is a very important issue, uh, not only uh, because of the conversation around climate change, but you know, North Brooklyn is one of the, what is one of the neighborhoods that has the worst air qualities in, in the city of New York. You know? We have the highest asthma rates because of that air quality. And to bring 200 buses into those, into those neighborhoods is only going to further uh, impact that, that reality. And I think that this is a, a great opportunity to use this, um, to use this as, as a way to make a commitment to the communities that we are working to improving their quality of lives but also a commitment to the globe that we're also going to commit to doing our part uh, when dealing with the issues of climate change. The MTA takes that responsibility very seriously and um, overall, as part of the MTA network, we are a net carbon emission saver. Uh, we take off about 17 metric tons of uh, emissions uh, annually. So we feel us that the MTA does have a responsibility to, um, to be a good participant and a good neighbor in, in all of our communities that we serve. So how much money is being dedicated towards the 200 buses? Uh, what, I, what I could say is, is currently the, uh, the uh, you know, standard bus costs us in the neighborhood of uh, $500,000, and the articulated buses, which will be operating on 14th Street in the neighborhood of $850,000. 
Okay, I, I'm just, you know, and I'm, I'm going to continue struggling with this question, but it's, it just doesn't make sense to me that we're purchasing, uh, we're spending millions of dollars on new buses when the MTA is committed, as, as you said, to get into a pilot program to start transitioning our fleet into electric, that we're making, we're doubling down our commitment on diesel. I just think that we should take a harder look at why we're spending new money on diesel when there is a pilot that's going to come out soon to get electric out on our streets. That would, this, this should be something that we should have a, a much deeper conversation around sure. how we spend this new money. Glad to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Before I call this on my colleague, I have a question related to the, to the ferry. I know, Commissioner, you mentioned it, that one. But will the temporary ferry service be run by the MTA or DOT? Will it be integrated with the citywide New York City ferry system? Or will an RFP be issued for a private operator? We are actually in discussions with EDC now, who does oversee the ferry system to create a supplement to that system. Okay. Can we use at this time of the closure, and this is my suggestion, I would like to suggest that during the time of the closure of the L train, riders should be allowed to transfer from the ferry to the buses with the same fare. Yes, that, that's currently the intent. We're still looking at various fare strategies, but certainly that would be a, a, a reasonable po policy. Okay, and I hope that this will serve for us as a pilot, you know, as a pilot project, because if we work, I hope that one day in New York City, you know, we should integrate the payment system for riding from the bike, city bike, to the ferry, buses, and the train to be able to transfer with the same fare. Is that something that we can look at, at least NTA can look at it? I think that's a separate conversation, but one that we would clearly participate in. Great, thank you. Council member. I just have one more question on, on back to the buses, electric buses. Um, if, if the city council was gracious enough to donate some capital dollars to the MTA, would the MTA consider using those dollars to buy electric buses? I'm never one to turn down graciously offered funding. Um, so uh, let me start there. Um, but I, I, do, I do caution. I mean, let's, let's be careful. Let's make sure that the buses work in this very harsh environment on which we run our buses. Um, we have had problems in the past making a quick buy of something and it didn't turn out so well. So I do, I, I do want to take the, the pilot program. I'm glad we're rushing to get it on those buses on the streets. And then let's continue the conversation. Is there any other city that they mainly use the buses, that the buses are electrical buses? Yes, but there's no place like New York. But I, I, that's at, the, at the National Convention, the Democratic National Convention, I know that there, there was the new company providing their services, doing the exhibition in front of the hotel, mm -hmm. showing how Philip is going in many areas, electrical buses. Yes. Yeah. And New York City should be leading that one too. So I, you know, I congratulate the initiative that you're taking and also, I understand the precaution that you're having, but I hope that we as a city look at yes. leading a, a, a effort to be electric. Councilmember Dangara. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thanks to all of you for your uh, testimony today. Uh, obviously, um, we fully recognize the challenges that you are facing uh, uh, for uh, circumstances that uh, are what they are. Um, but with that, I, I will note that um, the, the notion that there would be some sort of a physical bus terminal um, across the street from Stuyvesant Town uh, is news to me was, you know, I learned it just as we were chatting before the hearing, uh, and news to uh, the property management in Stuyvesant Town and certainly to all Stuyvesant Town tenants. <clears throat> so we just ask that there be uh, particularly on the, you know, the significant structural changes that you might anticipate a higher level of um, uh, exchange here. Um, uh, obviously, I'm, I have only a couple weeks left in this role, but uh, this is going to be important uh, going forward. Uh, so I'd like to talk to you about that uh, first. Um, so the, the ferry landing that's anticipated to come in at Stuyvesant Cove <clears throat> it comes in around 20th Street, um, just uh, off of Avenue C, obviously, <clears throat> the East River. 
Uh, Avenue C is a two lane in each direction um, uh, road, which is frequently backed up, particularly in the southbound uh, direction as a result of existing buses. It's no standing any time. Uh, cars are not supposed to stop there, but there is a bus stop on Avenue C, particularly on the north side of uh, 20th Street. Wh where, is this, uh, where is this terminal exactly uh, anticipated to go, um, and how exactly would it work? Uh, before I uh, turn over to Peter Caffiero to, to provide some details, I do want to do want to define the word terminal. I think you know we use that word at the start and end of our lines. That does not mean the construction of some kind of an imposing structure or uh, a, a significant amount of uh, buses just hanging out there. This is a we think this is going to be a moving a moving facility, a moving line, and that's the intent. Um, but to add to that, we are fortunate that there is infrastructure there that provides a little bit of, of shelter, which is the FDR drive. So the, the concept, which is elevated, as you know, at that point, our goal was to make sure that customers coming off the ferry could get to buses easily without having to uh, interact with the traffic, if possible, that we could have a place that the bus could uh, could recover f for its next trip, get to, uh, so we have some time to make sure it, it has a uh, scheduled departure that could operate safely with all of the car and pedestrian interactions. So we're working with the city um, to adapt the parking lot right in that area so that buses can come in, have a convenient boarding area, uh, let their customers off, take on new customers, and then come out at 20th Street and go back down uh, at the 20th Street signal and go back down Avenue C. You, you would need physical changes to be able to right. allow for a terminal, whether it's for a bus mm -hmm. or several buses at a time, to be able to lay over there. Is that accurate? That is accurate. We're, we would be doing some minor uh, physical changes uh, there and then restoring it at the end of the project. Uh, I, I'm, I think we should discuss what minor physical changes constitute. Uh, we've had conversations about uh, Stuyvesant Town's own trucks that they use for uh, garbage movement and disposal not even being able to potentially fit into that space and they are smaller than a city bus. So I, I would just note for you that the physical changes may be uh, more significant than perhaps anticipated. Um, but uh, there currently are uses for that space underneath the FDR drive. Uh, what are those uses today? It's the parking lot. Okay, so it's parking. Do we have? Does the city have any obligation to the to people who've uh, uh, entered into a, a, an agreement for that purpose, or or is that a waivable by a month's notice or so? It, it, it's it's EDC parking, and they're committed to working with us. Again, I think from the city's point of view, we we we're in urgent mode here. So, and, and it's incredibly important that we have a good staging area for these buses. To I, I got. It. I'm really just area, asking so. what the what the legal rights are yeah. of the people no, who I, use that for. I, I think we will have the ability to work through the. the and how about the chief medical examiner? I believe they're also parked down there. We will work with all our city agencies and, and do our best to accommodate them as needed. Okay. If, for some reason, uh, this is not able to be accommodated, either because of the structural limitations of uh, the area under the FDR drive or the cost. Oh, boy, I didn't even know I was on a clock. Can't believe it. Um, all right, Mr. Chairman, may I ask this last question then? Um, what alternatives uh, do the MTA or DOT have uh, to using this space as a terminal location, um, and, and also while you're at it, if you could tell us what you believe the cost to be of any physical changes that you might need to do under the FDR drive to make it amenable to a terminal, that would be useful. I'm just going to do two questions in one, and I'm going to drop it. I think uh, to your second question, we'd have to get back to you on the cost. We're still evaluating that. Uh, to the first question, I think this is the only feasible location for a ferry. The ferry is a key part of the plan. Uh, it's described as a niche market, but the, we expect equivalent of one L train's worth of customers to come over this way, and that's uh, good for them, but also good for uh, our management of the entire L volume of customers. And uh, we'll, we'll work with you and, and others to figure out how to make it fit. Um, I'm sorry. In the, so the 
the cost? We'll, we'll cost, you said you don't know yet. We'll get, we'll get back to you on the cost You're, of that landing. Uh, and on the, on the feasibility, if it does not, if it is not feasible, the answer is it just has to be feasible? We think it is feasible. Okay. And so we're starting from that premise. And okay. The alternative would be more street, uh, street running. Not, okay. like, not great. All right. Well, I think we're going to need to have more, more conversations about that. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Councilmember Reynoso, followed by Councilmember Chin. Uh, thank you again, Chair. Uh, and thank you for being here. Uh, I just want to point out that I hope moving forward, a hearing is not the reason why we get updates on exactly what's happening for the outtrain shutdown. Um, I really feel that if it wasn't for the chairman, the chairman's leadership to bring this hearing today, it might have taken a longer time to hear from you on updates about what's happening with the outtrain shutdown. I just hope moving forward as partners in tr making this happen, this is going to happen and it has to happen the right way. We all have to be on the same team making it happen. I don't want it to be an us versus them situation, but it makes it very difficult um, when I feel that the communication is just not happening at the rate that it was happening earlier on, where I really felt that we were communicating on a regular basis. So I hope we to, to reinforce the fact that meeting uh, with us regularly will help this transition and will help this process along. Um, this is the statement that I want to make first. Um, then I want to speak to Williamsburg, um, especially Grand Street. Uh, I know it's complicated. It's not as wide as 14th Street. So uh, I heard in your statements that we will be getting a protected bike lane on Grand Street. Um, just hearing that, is a, is a step in the right direction towards our ultimate goal of making Grand Street a, a model to, to the future of street design here in the city of New York is what I'm hoping that we're looking to. Um, I want to make sure that I acknowledge that we're getting increased service on the G line and lengthening the train to increase capacity, increased service on the JMZ lines, additional station turnstiles at Marcy and Lorimer stops, weekends and overnights M's will run to 96th Street, um, the free metro car transfer, transfers between Broadway G, Lorimer, and Hughes, which is huge. Uh, new platforms at the Metropolitan and Lorimer stops, which I'm guessing are G-related as well, um, off of uh, Powers is what I'm hoping we're talking about. Um, actually opening up those entrances and thinking about opening up the entrance on Union and Grand Street as well. Um, the ADA compliance at Bedford is going to be amazing. I think that's good. And the, the new ferry route from North... Williamsburg to Stuyvesant Cove. I don't want to take away from the work that you are doing from Brooklyn, but I think we're falling short in comparison to what we're seeing happening in Manhattan, when most of the riders are going to be moving from Brooklyn to Manhattan. Uh, so I just wanted to ask about that movement. And the HOV lane on the Williamsburg Bridge is what is currently being proposed. Um, I saw in a statement that it was the minimum of what will happen is an HOV lane of three plus uh, people. So I wanted to ask, is that the minimum because there's still an opportunity here to get a bus dedicated lane on the Williamsburg Bridge? Well, I don't know if you want to start again with sub Brooklyn subway service and then I'll jump in on bike lanes and, and HOV lane. Okay, I think you hit the high points of the improvements on all of the subway service in Brooklyn as well as the station improvements that we'll be doing at Marcy, Lorimer, Broadway Junction, Court Square, Nassau Street, Metropolitan Lorimer. Um, reopening station entrances um, on the JMZ, Flushing Avenue at Fayette Street, Metropolitan Avenue at Powers, and U Street that you mentioned as well. I, I think you, you have a very good handle on all of the upgrades that will be going on and the benefits of the project, not just the tunnel reconstruction, but the Bedford Avenue station, the, the accessibility at that station, and also in Manhattan. And I do want to respond. I, I hear you, Council Member. I, I think we will acknowledge that the, the past few months we have not been in as good communication as we should. I'll, I'll, I think I'll say on behalf of both our teams, this, this plan literally has thousands of moving pieces, and I think we took some time to try and get it in good enough shape. The, the, the hearing was certainly timely, and we appreciate having it, and, and we certainly pledge going forward. We agree. We're going to need your, your partnership, your leadership, your help from all of the elected officials in these areas. As, as you're hearing from our honest testimony, a lot of challenging decisions to be made. 
The Williamsburg Bridge, just, just to explain, those of you who are very familiar with it, um, the outer roadways, although they're technically two lanes, because it's a 114-year-old bridge, those, those lanes are really only nine feet wide. So they really can only accommodate you, you know, trucks and buses. So our vision is HOV3 in the inner roadway, and that will help with traffic flow into Williamsburg trucks and buses on the outer roadways, so they will essentially be busways. The one exception is cars that are going to be making a right onto Clinton Street in Manhattan when you get off the bridge, because if you put them in the inner roadway, you have more complication and conflicts when you get to the Manhattan side. But we don't think that will be a big volume and tremendously disruptive on the bus front. So that is the plan on Williamsburg. And you're correct that we've started off by saying peak hours is the minimum, but I think that's going to be the discussion about what peak hours looks like, how long that needs to be, and, and we look forward to engaging with people on that discussion. Um, and Chair, just the timing, it, it's a, there's a very important issue in my district, and I just feel like one question wasn't enough. I'm just gonna ask a couple more, I apologize. Uh, the, the enforcement on, on, in the Williamsburg Bridge, it just seems very impractical. There's no shoulders on the Williamsburg Bridge. Um, how exactly are we going to reinforce that buses and, and HOV lanes are being respected um, to make sure that this happens? And we are talking to the NYPD about how best to do that enforcement. I think it'll be on the, the bus lanes and the bridge itself, a combination of PD enforcement, and we're hoping to get authority from the state to do more automated enforcement with cameras. It is a challenge, certainly, on the New York City bridges that you don't have great areas on either end to pull people over, but we have found there are ways where perhaps NYPD can be one end of the bridge and, and give word ahead to officers on the other end of the bridge. So, so we are going to work through the logistics of that while acknowledging it's, it's challenging. And then uh, city bike. We, we didn't necessarily hear about city bike expansion, specifically in Bushwick, where it seems that uh, a lot of outtrain riders are from Bushwick. Um, it's growing in population, uh, and it actually has two decent uh, bike lanes on Evergreen and Central, um, and it just doesn't seem like we're looking to um, expand uh, City Bike into Bushwick ahead of time because of the outtrain shutdown. I think it would be something that we should look at uh, because it's gonna be, it, it could be the difference between folks cramming into a bus, uh, uh, the subway on the JMZ, for example, on Myrtle Broadway, and maybe just taking a bike in a route that makes a lot of sense um, along Evergreen and Central. We agree. I've, you know, had initial discussions with Jay Walder at Motivate about how we're going to work with, with them as the L train shutdown occurs. Um, this also feeds into, as some of you know, the larger discussion we're having about what the phase three of uh, bike chair is going to look like in the city, you know, potential mix of dockless bikes. So all those questions are in the air, but Motivate is very committed to working with, and then we know that Bushwick is an area where we're going to want to see bike share if we can make it work. And then my, I got two, just two more questions regarding the electric buses. So we have three times the asthma rates as uh, entrance into Woodhull Hospital than anywhere else in the city of New York, or in the average of the city of New York. Uh, the Marcy Avenue hub, I would call, I, I don't know what you guys call it. I guess it's Havemeyer by South Fifth and Broadway is the bus depot. That bus depot is going to be probably the most populated bus depot when this shuts down. Uh, that we've seen in, a, in quite some time in North Brooklyn. Given that it is the epicenter of asthma rates and pollution, to add more buses to that that are not electric is a huge concern for us when we talk about the, the future of our children and, and what that means for the health of the young people in the South Side, which is already uh, um, a big problem. I just find it un practically unacceptable that we would even consider anything but electric buses uh, in uh, uh, for the expansion of what's happening on the out train. I have to let you know you cannot uh, leverage or, or, or gamble away the, the, the health of our children because of this crisis when there is an obvious alternative in electric buses. So I really want to actually ask for a hold or a moratorium. Um, even, we're the city council, we're not the state, so we, we're limited in our capacity to oversee and, and hold you accountable to certain things. But I would appreciate if you hold on procuring and purchasing of the 200 diesel buses until after the pilot regarding the electric buses is completed so that we can see and uh, to see if we can have an opportunity to then move forward with possibly purchasing 200 electric buses by 2019. I'm really hoping that you, you take heed and, and pay attention to that. And then the last thing is um, 
the deliveries along Grand Street are a huge concern, and I understand that that makes it complicated. Um, so, again, I want to sit with the bid and with DOT to really discuss how we can do that the right way. Uh, but it is not a reason, and it should not be the reason on why we can't figure something out on Grand Street. I feel that we're smart enough here to put our heads together to think through a plan that can allow that to happen. And when we speak about parking on Grand Street, uh, also that the majority, I think it's over 84% in a survey that was done in 2012, I believe, by Graham Avenue actually, found that 84% of the people were walking or taking the train or a public bus to shop along those corridors. That vehicles were the last means to people to get to shopping on Grand Street and Graham, and that most of the parking is actually used by the workers and the owners of these businesses. So that we really think twice about whether or not parking is a priority there and to really get through this delivery issue so we can finally get a plan to present to our constituents before it's too late and before we get an opportunity to, to speak on those issues. Well, I mean, let me pledge to you, as, as we've discussed, Grand Street, I think, remains the biggest piece that we need to finalize our plans, and we understand that everyone is anxious to, to make sure we get that right as, as soon as possible. We, this is something we could sit down before the end of this year and start, you know, finalizing those plans, talking to the, the business interests and I agree with you. We, we have enough smart people that we should be able to figure this one out, and, and we'll thank you for your leadership on that. Thank you, Chair. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, Council Member Rami Metal, D uh, DOT, Director of Strategic Engagement. I just wanted to point out that we've already been in touch with your office about setting something up for as soon as next week. Um, and if you want to include the bid in that conversation, we're happy to have that. If it wants just you, just let us know. Rami, you play a double role. You're a former Bro a North Brooklynite. We're no, going to hold you accountable no, to no, a high only standard. Only councilman. I understand. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for, for your leadership, and thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Councilmember Johnson followed by, I'm sorry, Councilmember Chin followed by Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, and thank you, uh, Commissioners and Director. I look at this map, and from your testimony, um, 70 buses per hour, <laughs> that's more than one bus a minute. I just can't envision them coming down Williamsburg Bridge. And the turn that you make, it's not just 14th Street, going down Delancey and making that, that turn, I guess the question is like, then they're gonna go back on Delancey, back on Williamsburg Bridge, right? This is the, the lower Manhattan part. Mm -hmm. Um, my question is that right now at Commissioner Trottenberg, you know that my constituents has been complaining about the congestions along Delancey and Grand where people are turning to get on the, the bridge, uh, all the, the honking. And so for them to see all these buses coming, uh, especially during peak hour, rush hour, and then making that turn where all those streets are so congested. I mean, it might work in a model, but in reality, because the bus also have to make stops, right? I'm looking at here, I assume they stop at certain streets so that they could get on the subway. Lafayette and so it's not just Delancey riding and through. Houston. So if you can, you yeah, know. There, there's, no, there's no question that, that this is gonna be one of our biggest challenges. Part of the reason we do feel strongly that we're going to need those HOV3 lanes for some amount of time every day on the Williamsburg Bridge is on a normal day, we're seeing 4,000 cars come over during those peak periods. And so to the extent that we're seriously reducing that car traffic, that is going to help process okay. those buses. But I, I, you know, believe me, I think we have, you know, part of, again, why it took us a little time to come back to you all is we are spending a lot of time looking at the models. And I, I totally agree. Modeling is one thing, human behavior is another, and you know, as I said, we have so many moving pieces to this whole plan that human behavior is going to play a role. But we are, again, doing what we can to minimize the traffic that comes over the bridge with the HOV lanes. We are going to have to work very closely with PD and our own roadway design folks. You're right, as those buses get into lower Manhattan to ensure that they can make the turns and don't completely clog the streets in the process. Are you going to be, are you going to do any trial run yeah, yeah, <laughs> to see yeah. how this will work? I mean, maybe we can come along and our constituents also could participate to really see how mm -hmm. you can get those buses to really be able to circulate those crowded streets. And 
I'm fully support HOV lanes. We should implement them now. Uh, you know, it should be a daily occurrence because there is too many cars coming in with just one person in there. So we, sh we should definitely get that going. But just in terms of making that circulation and also relating to the subway, um, I mean, MTA, are you prepared to accommodate more riders on those platforms that's already extremely yes. crowded right now, especially on the, Drake, the F train? And also the F train doesn't run on most of the weekend now because of the uh, repairs that's going on. So um, in terms of your, your first points on the bus routes itself, you know, this, this plan that we have um, put forward is what we think a, a, a good preliminary plan. We are trying to connect people to the subway stations um, that are in this area as indicated on the map on the, on the board. I, I think your idea of taking a ride with us to see how this, this route actually works is a good one. We'll take you up on that and consider uh, uh, an opportunity to do that. Um, it, it does require the HOV3 process to work and to be enforced and work well. I, I think that's correct as well. Um, and in terms of the subway capacity, yes, we will be coordinating with our subway folks to make sure that if we're bringing riders to a station, it, it, can, it can have the capacity and the subway service to meet those demands as well. Um, and that is really one of the reasons why we need to go back out into the communities and do another round of outreach and get more feedback. I think that's very important in terms of with like community board three, yeah. um, the resident, we will happy to go ride along with you uh, to see how the traffic mm -hmm. will get impacted. But I think that for the HOV lane, I really urge the city, get that started now. Um, because if that, you could do that, that could help us minimize some congestion that we have already. So that, that would be a great start. And that's what I will push for too. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair Rodriguez. I want to concur with uh, Councilmember Reynoso, and thank you for calling this hearing and for your leadership on this issue of you and your staff. It, for those of us whose neighborhoods it deeply affects, I really want to thank you for your leadership on this. So I want to start with uh, Managing Director Hakem. Thank you um, for your testimony. Uh, and what I'm about to ask is not me being confrontational, it's just me being skeptical. So how confident are we on the timeline that's presented? We're very confident, and I would say the contractor has put a lot of money on this table because there are delay damages. If he were to be late re finishing in this time period, it would cost him $400,000 a day. Okay. So I heard the same things when the 7 train uh, at Hudson Yards ended up being almost two years late. Uh, Tom Prendergast, who's a fantastic guy, kept coming here and saying, it's going to open, it's going to open, it's going to open, and it was two years late. Second Avenue Subway, we know what happened in trying to rush and get it done. So I just want to be clear, like, this has to get done in the time. I don't want two months before July of 2020 for you all to come and say, you know what, it's supposed to be July of 2020, but it's going to be October of, it's going to be September of 2020. Like, it's just, I understand the, the cost penalty escalation that you all put in, and I hope that's a big incentive for the contractor that's involved, but the number of riders, and not just riders, residents in the affected corridor from Canarsie to uh, the West Village and West Chelsea is enormous, and we cannot have any delay on this. I agree with you, and on the Montague Street tube job, same contractor, same type of work, done a little ahead of schedule. Okay, great. So, Commissioner Trottenberg, uh, 14th Street, I don't really understand what, and I would like to know, what data was used to decide that vehicular traffic should no longer be on the eastbound corridor that's highlighted on the L train mitigation map and the westbound corridor on 14th Street uh, where vehicular traffic will no longer be allowed. What data was used to determine these things? Because as I've said to you and your staff who have been fabulous, Rami has been incredible to work with, uh, two years ago 17th Street between 7th and 8th Avenue was shut down for six weeks. 
During that time, every other side street, one block area, was a parking lot. You, I live on 15th Street between 7th and 8th Avenues. Couldn't get down the block. 13th Street couldn't get down the block. So now vehicular traffic is going to be rerouted off of a major crosstown thoroughfare to 12th Street, 13th Street, 15th Street, 16th Street, 17th Street, 18th Street, 11th Street. And it is going to have such a deleterious impact on these local residential blocks. We saw it happen on one block, 17th Street. So I'd like to understand what data was used to figure out that this is the best plan, not just for not just for moving people across 14th Street, but for the entire neighborhoods and areas that are affected by the L train shutdown. So I'm, I'm going to sort of make some overarching comments, and then I'm, I'm going to let uh, let our expert Eric Beaton talk about the data. And, and and just to sort of remind you what we're proposing at the moment. Uh, and again, this is very much subject to I think the outreach and the feedback we're going to get from elected officials, businesses, community boards, you name it. We're proposing a, a key busway that essentially runs third, between 3rd and 8th or 9th, rush hour periods, buses only. So not, we're not closing that. At the moment, the proposal is not to close that stretch off to all vehicular traffic all the time. But in those key rush hour periods, when, as you've heard from my colleague, she needs to run a, a bus basically every minute to accommodate the 50,000 formerly underground L riders. Now, one thing we did, you know, there was, an there was a hope that we would perhaps run that busway the entire length of 14th Street. One of the things, and I'm going to have Eric talk about the data, is we did conclude that 3rd to 8th and 9th was the stretch that got us the most transportation benefits during those rush hour periods of keeping buses moving, and at least best we could minimize some of the traffic impacts. But I, I can't promise there aren't going to be any traffic impacts on neighborhoods. There are going to be huge traffic impacts. Well, and, I, you and, know, I, 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 but what's the plan for that? Well, you know, part of the plan is going to be, again, doing what we can to discourage people from driving into Manhattan during this time period. I mean, I, I'm going to say that very strongly. During these 15 months, we really need to discourage people from driving into Manhattan. It is going to be extremely challenging to do so. But let's, let me ha now have Eric talk about the data and part of how we crafted this plan. Sure. And one thing that I'll, I'll say, and, we, and we've talked about this at community meetings and with a lot of your constituents, is we don't, we don't think there's anything we could do or not do here that wouldn't have some traffic effects on, on, west, on the west side, on, in the village, in Chelsea. That even if we did nothing on 14th Street, just the dramatic number of people coming to the surface, the additional bus service, it would all have some spillover effect on the, on the streets around it. So what, what we see as our mission is we have to figure out how we're going to move as many people as possible while minimizing to the extent we can the effect on those streets. So what we did was we collected a tremendous amount of new data, traffic counts on, on every street in the area, and we used a number of simulation models to say, okay, if we close this stretch, how does traffic reroute? If we close this stretch, how does traffic reroute? And try to do that in, in the most careful way we could. And one of the things that we found is that sometimes if you close a very, very small stretch, it can cause worse traffic impacts because what you get is people get a little bit confused. They're not expecting it. They, they, you know, when you close a single block like this situation you're talking about on 17th Street, people try to just reroute very locally. And what we saw, and this was both something that came out of our analysis and something that we think reflects how people really use the city, is that when you close a longer stretch and really message it correctly, some of the people really reroute out of that area. They, they'll take is, the FDR drive. Is this the data available? Highway. I, we can certainly share traffic counts. And we post this data on a website because my constituents are apoplectic this morning after reading about this plan in the New York Times last night. I mean, they are literally apoplectic, uh, wondering what the impact is going to be. And so this is no disrespect to, to Commissioner Trottenberg, who has been a great advocate and ally and partner the last four years. But I can't go back to them and say, the DOT commissioner is going to discourage people from driving in Manhattan. They're going to laugh at me if I say that. And yet, I, I have to say it. I, mean, I understand I, you have to I, say I, it. I, I, do, I do think this is, you know, the, the enormity of the challenge we're facing with, you know, 50,000 people on 14th Street that were formerly traveling underground coming up to the surface, accommodating them. And again, 
we want to accommodate them with buses so they don't all try and get into Ubers because that will only make the traffic situation worse. So I, I think it's funny. I'm, I've heard some complaints, this is too minimalist. We're not doing enough for buses on 14th Street. I hear for your constituents, they may feel like we're doing too much. We tried to strike that right balance. We will be happy to share the data and work through this, but I want to sort of emphasize what Eric said. If we do nothing, the, unfortunately, the streets of Lower Manhattan will be filled with traffic during these 15 months. I mean, so it's, it's, can we post it's, this data? Absolutely. Okay. And then last thing, Mr. Chairman, and then I know we have to move on. Is PD here? Okay. So uh, any day of the week without the L train being shut down, with the new protected bike lanes, which I've been supportive of, and again, my constituents don't love those protected bike lanes, most of them, but I've been supportive of them on 8th Avenue, 9th Avenue, 7th Avenue. Traffic is horrendous because tractor trailer trucks double park, which causes vehicular cars to back up two blocks, three blocks, four blocks, and they can't get around it. There is zero enforcement, or it's a cost of doing business if there is enforcement. So it's every day of the week, come to 8th Avenue, come to 7th Avenue, it causes huge traffic snarls. We need to figure this out and how the local priest precincts and uh, 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 the, the uh, Commissioner Chan is going to reallocate resources to do something about this because I understand there's a lot of competing pieces right here, but it all is MTA, DOT, TLC, NYPD, and all of the agencies working together in a coordinated way. And I feel like currently, even with this being a problem that's ongoing, nothing is really done on a day-to-day -day basis. So we, we have started those discussions with NYPD and with Chief Chan, who, as you know, I work very closely with. And look, obviously, they're going to need to be at the table. And, you know, we are starting coming in the, the coming weeks and months to start to implement some of what the mayor announced a couple months ago on tackling congestion. NYPD is getting a lot of new resources to bring to the table. But, of course, strategic enforcement is a big challenge in the city. I won't say otherwise. And, you know, I hear you, I think, as part of the outreach piece of this, we're going to need to make sure they're at the table to hear from you all, hear from your constituents and really focus on where those hotspots are going to be. And I recognize there will be quite a few of them. So I'm going to come back for a second round. I just want to say, I know you have to say, it, Commissioner Trottenberg, about discour discouraging people using cars in Manhattan, coming into Manhattan. I need a better answer to my constituents. And I don't feel like I have that answer today, both from reading the Times story and from reading the testimony. I don't say that in an adversarial way. I say that because... I need to understand how you arrived at these decisions so that I can explain that to my constituents and then we can move forward to figure out how to mitigate the impact on residential side streets and on these neighborhoods. Thank you. If you could put me down for a second round of questions. Before I call you my colleagues that has not, have not asked a question, Councilmember Dolchin and Levin, have you looked, first of all, we, do we agree, right, that when we look at the bus services in New York City, I assume that the leadership of the MTA is looking at DOT at that opportunity on area that we had to improve services, like to running buses uh, safer, faster from point A to point B? Yes, we're, we're always reviewing our bus service to, to, to uh, see to improve. I, I'm more, and I know, that you are, you know, in a place right now where from the state to the city, you know, New Yorkers have the big expectation with the new leadership of the MTA. And I do too. And I'm very proud to see again in the role that you're having on the MTA. So I also have my expectation that this is not like business as usual, as usual. like that there's a plan that we have right now that we are saying from how we run in the train and the buses. We have our five, 10 year plan, and we want to leave a legacy during the time that we serve that we will make major improvement. Yeah. So is that something that we can say that the buses is like services, one of those areas that yeah. we can make major changes in New York City? Yes, it is. And the most recent example that I have was the um, discussion recently on the Staten Island Express bus market and how to completely change that routing and make great 
changes, dramatic changes to improve that service. And that is the model that we're going to be using to review our bus service going forward. Okay. So I just want to, and I hope, like to believe, right, that we are looking at this area where riders will be affected by the closure of the trains as an opportunity also for we to do some pilot program for us to be able to say, what things can we do during those kind of construction with the bus services that we can learn from, from that we can expand the citywide? So what is our plan that we have when it comes to the bus services? You know, SBA is great. Can we make those buses BRT? Can we have more feature in those services that we can say those buses will be running you know, faster and safer, that we have a plan to turn those buses as an above the ground train system for the rider to say, here we are looking in that area, how the bus services will be operating in the future in New York City. I think specifically as an example will be the work that we do jointly working together on the rollout of the new um, M14 SBS service and the improvements that DOT will be implementing and we'll be working in coordination with them on 14th Street itself. Have you looked, and again, I guess looking at what you have exhibit to us, it, Commissioner, how much it take to build a ferry landing in average. How much money? Yeah. I, it, I think it depends on the infrastructure that's already there, and I, I have to admit that's been on the MTA side. So I don't know if you all have gotten an estimate yet. Of no, we, we're Stuyvesant still Cove. working um, for what the new ferry landing on Stuyvesant Cove at 20th Street will cost, but um, working with EDC on that. Can we say that that probably less than $10 million? Oh, yeah, significantly. Right? Yeah. Significantly. Have you looked, and again, I want to be there in 2020 when we finish this project to be sure that, you know, we show that we really are making improvement on how we're building, saving money, and also doing project on time. And I believe again on your capacity. Have you looked at the possibility for the ferry landing instead of being at 23rd Street to be at Fortune Street and to run bus, shuttle buses my idea is, have you looked at the possibility to maintaining the services, similar services in the area affected by the train stations? There's the large Con Edison facility there that would block access to the waterfront. Um, so that we think 20th Street is the right place for that ferry landing. Okay. What about shuttle buses across from 14th Street? through Bedford Avenue. So, um, just... When the ferry, we, right, the ferry landing the Brooklyn right. side? Right, so... The so Brooklyn side from that particular area where the ferry is landing from there to maintain okay. both shuttle services along Bedford Avenue. Okay, so, uh, so the ferry itself First of all, the north, we're taking advantage of the city ferry piers that are going to be in both locations. So we may expand uh, those a little bit, but largely we will be using the, the sites the city has developed coincidentally. Um, north 6th Street, it's basically impossible to get bus service in there. It's a narrow side street to get to the waterfront uh, in that area. Also, the, the capacity of the ferry, we feel, will be filled with, with people who live within walking distance of that pier. So uh, it's primarily will be serving uh, people who, residents who live along the waterfront in Williamsburg, and, and that's a key market to serve uh, rather than uh, walking south to the J or, or west back, uh, east back to the L train. Okay. But there is another bus route that we should perhaps discuss. Right, so there's, there's what we're right now calling the L3. We obviously, work on, on the naming of this to make sure it's, uh, it's clear to the public when we launch it, but it's a route that will run from North 5th Street, uh, which is as close as we could get to Bedford uh, and, and have a good street flow and, and an area for a bus stop. The area around Bedford Station itself will be under construction. 
Uh, but basically to serve that market, uh, stop at North 5th Street, we'll also stop uh, near the entrance to the Williamsburg Bridge and then go across and connect with the subways in Manhattan. Councilmember Dodge, followed by Councilmember Levin. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like, I have some questions about operation discouragement. Um, first of all, my question is that the closure will, is supposed to take place in April 2000 and 2019. Um, so when do, you, when do you plan on implementing your, your plan on uh, increasing uh, bus service and ferry service? And uh, are you, you have any plans on exercising the plan? And if yes, in what stages? Because obviously you don't have like certain bike lanes and, and other things um, in, in place now. But I know like in the NYPD, if God forbid there's a terrorist attack, they have a counterterrorism that constantly does exercise training to see how things would play out. We can't wait for that day to happen and then when there's a catastrophe, we start panicking and saying, oh, this is what it is, we have to wait till, uh, till the end of uh, two, uh, till July 2020 and this affects uh, over 225,000 riders, so. So the, the different strategies, I think, will be phased in over a period of time. <coughs> uh, aside from the implementation of the SBS route on 14th Street that the commissioner referenced as, as going in in 2018, I don't think we have a, a calendar yet for those implementation dates. We'll con be continuing to discuss them with, with um, your constituents and, and different community boards. What we did before um, the summer plans is we did exercise. We ran bus routes, we ran ferry services, and we anticipate we'll do the same thing here. Okay, great, that uh, sounds good. Um, so are there any studies or stats that you have on how many calls there are for first responders for EMS, uh, NYPD, uh, in that, in, in the impacted areas where this plan is taking place, where you, we, we are uh, assuming that, um, we're expecting actually that there's gonna be a heavy traffic area. Yeah, and obviously emergency services are something that we take very seriously, and it's why traffic management is such an important part of how we look at this, this whole piece, that, we, that it's not just about moving the buses, but about looking at where there will be congestion and trying to find ways to mitigate that. One of our big concerns was that if we didn't look at, at uh, peak hour HOV restrictions on the Williamsburg Bridge, there could be such traffic congestion in Williamsburg that not only would the buses not be able to get to the bridge, but that other necessary services, which include emergencies, but even you know, police and fire and school buses and all the day-to-day the -day activities wouldn't be able to get to uh, those places. So it's why complementing all the transit improvements that, that we together with the MTA are making, we wanna make sure we're managing the traffic system as well as we can so that all those necessary activities can happen. And we're working closely with the police department, we've been talking with fire department, to make sure that anything we do is in line with their response routes and, and how they need to get places. Great, that sounds good. Um, uh, in addition, do you have uh, accessory? Do you have any stats on how many uh, people use accessory in that in that areas where it would impact uh, accessory users even more than how it does now? And if you do have a plan um, for accessory, how do you reach out to those people, to the ridership, to let them know that they're gonna be impacted and to let them know that if they need to go to a doctor's appointment, uh, don't expect to leave like <clears throat> a half hour before or plan ahead? We will um, be maintaining obviously our accessoride service, um, including uh, along 14th Street as well. And we will be, in, that is one of our communities that we will have to be uh, in very good communication with about just what the plans are, what the changes are, if there are potential um, uh, road changes that, that they're aware of them and how that might impact uh, an appointment schedule, et cetera. Our customer service for Accessoride will need to, to kick in a communication strategy along this plan as well. Okay, if you could let us know how that's gonna be done. If you don't have a plan now, if you could just let sure. us know in the future how that's gonna be done. Certainly. And, um, also, we, we, we spoke about we have two agencies here. We have the state MTA and New York City DOT, but I don't see uh, NYPD, like um, we asked before if NYPD is here. They're not, and so I know that when it comes to traffic throughout the city, they have traffic control offices. I have not heard one word about traffic control offices. So how are you working with the NYPD 
to bring in traffic control officers and what is your plan of that because I know we don't have enough traffic control officers um, to, to direct traffic throughout the city. So what is your plan on increasing them and coming to the council and asking us to see what we can do to put it in the budget, making sure that you have enough traffic control officers uh, for this plan and across the city for the rest of the year? So we have started those discussions with the NYPD with obviously lots more discussions to come and as I said to some of your colleagues and clearly we're going to want to have them at the table as we do this outreach and, and we work with all of the elected officials. They are starting to staff up in part to address the mayor's congestion plan that was announced uh, a couple months ago and, and that some of this, some of those activities will dovetail. One of their areas of enforcement, for example, is going to be Flatbush uh, leading on to the Manhattan Bridge. So some of what we already have planned we hope is going to help with this. But we recognize it's going to require resources and personnel and, and we will obviously need to, to partner with the council to, to get Okay, this. so if you could let us know on this before um, this will. goes in effect because I think that is very important. Uh, also, uh, to the MTA, you did mention here that we'll install elevators in both of these stations to make, the, to make them fully accessible under the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, while building a completely new entrance at Avenue A in Manhattan. So you proudly um, testified that you will be abiding by the Americans with Disability Act, but what is happening in the rest areas across the city that you are not abiding by the Americans with Disability Act? Well, we feel that we are abiding with the requirements of the ADA and are fully committed to um, increasing accessibility in the system. All of our buses are accessible. We have um, our key station plan that's almost finished. We will invest in this capital program almost $1 billion in additional station accessibility work. So this is a, a full commitment for us. It happens that in this program, these are the stations that are becoming ADA compliant as part of this program. But there's a lot of work system-wide going on. So how many, how many entrances do you have to, uh, to mass transit to the train stations throughout the city? In, we have 472 stations. That means thousands and thousands of, of entrances. I don't know the, the specific number. Is there any way to, uh, to get the numbers yes. of how many entrances and tell me which ones that are currently handicapped accessible? And if you could tell me that the rest of the entrances you are abiding by the, by the uh, Americans with Disability Act, like you just said. We'll give you a breakdown of which stations are accessible. It's by station. No, but which ones are not that, yes, we'll, that they we'll don't give, need to be handicapped We'll give accessible. you a breakdown of that. Okay. Um, could I get it, like, within the next couple of weeks? Or I'm going to have to wait till they implement uh, April 2019? No. We'll do it, we'll do it as quickly you. as possible. Thank you very much. And also, finally, I just want to say that um, uh, thank you for inviting the council member to, to come with you uh, on, on, that, on that ride. I, I would like to invite you to come to, to come with me in my district, if you don't mind, uh, to wait with me, with um, with a lot of, many of my constituents and wheelchairs and elderly at certain bus stops, just to show you firsthand how late those buses are coming. So I'd like to invite you to to my district. I, I know you have raised those concerns before, and we will we'll coordinate with your office. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Councilmember Levy. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Director Hakem, Commissioner Trottenberg, everybody uh, on the panel. Um, so I'm going to start off a uh, simple request. We're about 15, 16 months out. Will both agencies agree to come to monthly meetings with the community, the L-Train Coalition? We've already formed. We have a name. We have a Twitter handle or whatever. You know, we're all, we're all set. We're waiting. Can, because of the urgency here and because there are so many moving parts, as you said, Commissioner Trottenberg, um, we, will you guys commit to Absolutely. monthly meetings yes. at this point? We, we will commit to monthly meetings. Okay. For sure. Great. Or more if needed. Okay. I think Ditto. monthly should be fine. Ditto. We need to, okay. Excellent. Excellent. Um, have one, one thing that we've heard that hasn't been addressed, and I've just heard it from some constituents. Um, uh, in, I represent Greenpoint and Williamsburg, the north side. Um, there are uh, kids that go to school in District 1 in Manhattan uh, that, that reside in District 14, which is Williamsburg, Greenpoint. Um, you know, elementary school kids, um, because of, you know, that, that's, there's elementary schools on, that, on the lo uh, Lower East Side, East Village. Um, how are we looking at making sure that elementary school kids, middle school kids are able to um, uh, get to school in the morning. 
I mean, I, I, I think that's going to sort of be something we'll have to tailor situation by situation. Um, and, you know, something obviously we'll, we'll, we'll work with the MTA on. I mean, our, our goal, again, is to try and provide as much basically robust, duplicative first subway service for, for places that are going to be affected further out into Brooklyn, bus service as you get closer in. So, you know, if there's a particular score, there's a particular circumstance. We well, there's, there, I mean, it might be helpful to inquire with DOE of the, the number of District 14 kids and parents that are going to District 1 elementary and middle schools. And that might be a good place to start so that you can it, it kind of track where exactly how many kids we're talking about and, and, uh, and where they're going to school. Um, okay. Because it's a, it's, a, it's a thing. I mean, there's, you know, so we've heard it now from, from multiple. That's from multiple a good people. suggestion. Thank you. Um, so uh, I have, you know, I have a confession. I drive to work like most days, right? And I live in Greenpoint and I work down here. Um, and most days, let's say 90% of the time, uh, whether it's Google Maps or Waze or whoever's Whatever, I'm, whatever app I'm using to tell me the best way to get to work tells me to bypass the Williamsburg Bridge and go down to the Brooklyn Bridge. And I, and I drive on the, and I take the Brooklyn Bridge over almost every day, almost every day. I'd say one out of, about two out of a hundred times, it'll tell me to take the Williamsburg Bridge. Because the, because, it's mostly because, and this is something that, you know, after eight years of driving here every day, I go on the bridges, you know, multiple times a day. It, the traffic on, a, on the bridges is always based on how vehicles are exiting on the other side of the bridge. So, for example, the Brooklyn, if you look at the Brooklyn Bridge right now going into Brooklyn, it's going to be backed up probably to Manhattan because of getting all, onto Cabinet Plaza West there. There's a light there on Cabinet Plaza West at Old Fulton Street, and so that, that'll, that backs it up all the way to, to Manhattan. That's almost, it's almost ongoing perpetually, continually. Um, on the other direction, going into Manhattan, the Brooklyn Bridge is usually clear because cars can go onto the FDR Drive and most of the time the FDR Drive isn't that backed up. So, so there's a, I mean, if you, uh, this morning I drove over the Brooklyn Bridge and it was like, it was clear, it was clear. I could just go right over the, you know, go right over the Brooklyn Bridge and that's most days. And this is, I know this sounds anecdotal, I do this every day for eight years. So, you know, I, I have some, some experience with this. On the Williamsburg Bridge, going towards Brooklyn, it's usually pretty clear because it'll, you, most of the cars clear out onto the BQE. Once they get onto the BQE, they might get stuck in traffic. But the bridge itself is pretty clear. It's usually not backed up into Manhattan. Conversely, on the other side, and this is my whole point in this, on the other side, going into Manhattan, it is always backed up, the Williamsburg Bridge, because... The Lancy Street, there are, you, you run smack into traffic lights and multiple crossings. Um, you have a pedestrian crossing at Clinton Street, Suffolk Street, Norfolk Street, Essex, Allen, all the way through past Bowery, you have, you know, you have multiple crossings and there's not, a, there's not enough traffic enforcement agents to be able to clear it out. My point in all of this is if you're going to do the HOV on the inner roadway, trucks and buses on the outer roadway, it is absolutely essential that those buses have the right of way on Delancey Street so that they're not caught in that snarl of traffic that is perpetual. It could be at rush hour, it could be at five in the afternoon on a Sunday. It is always there. And so to get, it's just, it, they have to be able to get to Allen Street to go up First Avenue. And so that, uh, Director Hakem, you mentioned 25 minutes. I've said all along, if people, if commuters commute extends past an extra 20 minutes, you know, there's going to be hell to pay. People are willing to accept that this is a major capital project that needs to happen. We could all live with that. 20 minutes extra per each way, I think, is what people are willing to put up with. Anything more than that, they're not. So 25 minutes, that's a great... That's a great objective, but it absolutely, totally depends on having that right of way for the buses. Honestly, I don't even know why people need to turn right on Clinton Street. I, I don't, I mean, I don't know why they can't go down to Essex Street and make a right on Essex Street. So, but 
However it, however it has to happen, there's got to be that right of way, and well, I know that DOT knows how to do it. Right. Let me, let me answer that question. We, we are going to be creating dedicated right of way for the buses on Delancey Street. But I, I want to take a, a moment of realism on Delancey Street, too. It was a Vision Zero corridor, and part of what we did do there, actually we did, a, we did a press event there, and even the mayor noticed it, is we also tried to give people enough time to cross that street safely. There is a lot of pedestrian activity on that street. So it is going to be a balancing act, and, and that is why I will confess that your colleague didn't like to hear me say it, but if you can avoid driving into Manhattan, it, it will be a good thing in this time period. You, you referred to this as sort of a big capital project. This, is, this transcends any capital project that I have ever worked on because the impacts are so far-reaching. It will affect hundreds of thousands of people, and I think you're correctly getting at the point. It, it's not just going to affect people. People may think it's just 14th Street and Williamsburg, but it, it will affect motorists much further out into Brooklyn and Queens trying to come into Manhattan. And, you know, we are, I will say quite honestly, as I said in my testimony, still grappling with the traffic impacts of that and what the other mitigations are going to be. The HOV lanes will clearly help process buses onto the Williamsburg Bridge and off of the Williamsburg Bridge, but we are a dense city. We have a lot of pedestrians who are also trying to cross our streets, so I have to make sure that that's handled safely as well. Right, it's, but it's, it's also, it's just, it's, um, it's dealing with, Making sure that at least there's, if there's, if it involves traffic enforcement, you know, a, a constant uh, presence of traffic enforcement, you know, uh, uh, traffic you know, mitigation uh, officers, NYPD, on the on that side of the Williamsburg Bridge. It's just, it's, it's how do we make sure that the traffic is getting cleared out from the direct exit of the Williamsburg Bridge? Um, so, and and I I will say, the the Brooklyn Bridge can probably handle the displaced traffic from the HOV3 on the Williamsburg Bridge. I really think, I mean, it, again, I drive it every day. I can tell you, it, it is, it's, unless there's construction happening on the, Williamsburg, on, on the Brooklyn Bridge itself where they close the lane, and that was happening for a couple of years, but it, that, that work is done now, that, that generally moves, and that can handle more vehicular traffic. Now, the BQE is always messed up. Hillary Street's always messed up, so yes, there's a lot of moving parts there, but the actual crossings, I don't necessarily think that, like, for example, that, like, the Brooklyn Bridge needs to have an HOV lane as well. Like, I don't think that that's a requirement, or, or that anything here should be dependent on HOV lanes happening on the other bridges. Right, and look, we're, we're, not, we're not proposing what we're going to do on the other bridges yet, but even as you start to describe all the routes and streets and challenges, I mean, I was sort of would make the joke, this is, this is, you know, it's multivariable calculus for right now. I mean, there are just many, many thousands of factors we're trying to piece together. When you adjust one part of it, it has an effect on the other part. As, as you've heard from Eric Beaton, we've done a lot of traffic modeling, but there'll be more to come as we refine these plans. And I appreciate the modeling. I drive these, these bridges every single day for eight years. I, like, I know this stuff. Like, I, could, I think sometimes I could actually drive it with my eyes closed. I wouldn't do that. Please, please don't. I wouldn't do that. But it is, seriously, I mean, it might just, there's, as Councilmember Chin said, I mean, there's, there's modeling and then there's also lived real world experience and human behavior. And I think all that needs to be done with a certain common sense. Right. No, no and look, we, we, we are very much relying on elected officials, local residents, regular commuters to give us precisely that personal feedback. I, I'm not one to say modeling tells the whole picture. There is, a, there is a human factor when you do transportation planning and how people will behave. Models don't always capture it. So, I, you know, in the coming months, that is certainly going to be part of refining the plans. Um, about, actually, Clinton Street, who is using, who's turning right on Clinton Street at the end of the bridge? Why does anyone need to do that? So our challenge is that a huge portion of the people coming off of the bridge do want to go north. And if they don't do it at Clinton Street, it's actually much more disruptive to the buses if they turn at Essex or at Allen or some of the other places. Clinton at least has sort of the takeoff, the, the slip lane, so that it has its own place. If, they, if you force them to turn at the next intersections, then they have to merge across the bus lane to do that. So in, we actually think even just to move the buses, the more people we can get out of the way early, the better. So basically, so what you're going to say is, at the entrance to the bridge, if you want to turn right on Clinton Street, you must be in the outer roadway at the outset. So you're not then merging on exactly. after the, all the, after and, the and division. And slowing down the MTA's buses, which is the very thing we're most trying right. to avoid. Because I'm telling you, if people are sitting in, on a bus and it's not moving on the Williamsburg Bridge, people are just going to get out 
and start like walking on the bridge. They're just going to like march in protest uh, on the Williamsburg Bridge if that happens. So I, I just, I'm telling, whatever we have to do to prevent that scenario from happening where people are just sitting there, just like stewing, packed in like sardines on one of these buses, sitting there on the Williamsburg Bridge and it's not moving, that is not what we want to see happen. I, I, look, we I, all think, agree. I think I think we all agree. On yeah, that. both agencies are committing to trying to minimize right. that. But but I, I I will just say one more time: this is it's not a voluntary situation we find ourselves in. Hurricane Sandy very much damaged a tunnel, which is a crucial link that unfortunately does not have either subway redundancy or nice bridge redundancy. So all eyes are on the Williamsburg Bridge. We get that, but it is it is going to take a lot of hard work to keep that moving. So then there's sorry, I have two more questions here. One is construction. Right now, um, you know, a couple of years ago, I, uh, you know, I had a, a bill to cap FHVs uh, in the city of New York, uh, back when there were like 20,000 FHV licenses, and now there's like 100,000, right? And we did, we, we worked, we ended up not doing the bill. We worked with McKinsey. We had this great uh, uh, study that was done. And one of the things that the study showed was that uh, construction is one of the major drivers of of congestion right now in New York City. And that has only gotten worse. You know, the global economy, knock on wood, it's doing pretty well. Um, that mean, that's a good sign for construction in New York City. Banks are lending, builders are building, we're rezoning things. Things are happening in New York City all over the place. And all you have to do is go outside and see all the building that's happening. Every building that happens usually takes up a lane of, of roadway to be able to do it because we're in New York City. So, that has to be better coordinated because that will continue to be a driver of, of congestion on both sides of the bridge, on the approach and on the exit. Um, and if that's not better coordinated, I mean, I just, I, sometimes I don't think it's, it's just coordinated at all, but it's got to be very in, in, uh, intricately coordinated, I think, between the Department of Buildings, any developer that's applying for taking up a lane of traffic for an extended period of time, and DOT and MTA. Throughout, you know, if it's anywhere on any of these routes, it has the, it has the possibility of like, you know, creating all types of havoc. So can we make sure that like the DOB is, is, has a protocol in place to inform you guys of when, it, when they're looking at issuing a permit anywhere along these lines? I mean, you know, we work pretty closely with DOB and, and we work together very closely on permitting. Um, as you know, there is a tremendous demand for construction activity, for new places for people to live, for new businesses. So yes, we're going we're gonna to work hard to try and uh, you know, coordinate that construction activity best we can. But there is a, as you correctly point out, there is an, a, sort of an insatiable desire for construction right now in New York mm -hmm. City. It is an, it's a challenge even before we, we face the, the, the closing of the Canarsie Tunnel. Uh, and my last question is, have you, have you examined how you're going to be approaching the fare structure here? So our are the shuttle buses going to be free and then people will have to pay when they get on the subway? Because my general feeling on it is this. Everybody should probably pay to take the public transportation that they're going to take to get to wherever they're going. But they shouldn't have to pay twice. So if either, either they're going to get a free transfer or they shouldn't have to pay when they first get on. And if, if, the, if the major uh, interest is making sure that things are moving quickly, I would say you know, having some kind of free transfer system might not be the way to go because that's probably just going to mm -hmm. take more time. So um, we really, first we needed to figure out what we were going to propose and then we would need to address what the fair policy recommendations would be to our board. What we have been talking about and, and was asked a little bit earlier was, you know, about a transfer from the ferry to the SBS bus. We think that probably makes a lot of sense. But again, a complete package of what the fair policy will be around this plan is, is still a little ways away. Okay. I think that there's going to be an expectation from commuters that they're happy to pay for their commute. Nobody's expecting a free ride, but nobody should have to pay twice, right? So, you know, just be, you know, they should, if, if they would have, if they would have otherwise been able to do a free transfer from the L train to right. the 6 train, they should still be able to do that. Right. Well, you thank know? you. So, and, and th so just to be clear, the ferry involves some kind of city state coordination, something where it's the buses, that's all the MTA. Correct. That's exclusively your decision. Okay. And then lastly, I know you're both here. It's great. I want to make sure that you guys continue 
to work well together and that the city and state is, you know, does not, um, you know, that it doesn't get into some kind of rivalry or, you know, a, a, there needs to be, uh, a, a, I think we, you know, we citizens of, of New York City, we're counting on you guys, the residents of New York City are counting on you guys to, um, uh, to work seamlessly together. So I just want to encourage that to happen. Agreed. And continue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I know my colleague has a few more questions, very short. Yep. Dan and then Cor Thank you very much, Chair Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I just wanted to focus back on now 14th Street and 1st Avenue. Um, we have a high level of demand coming straight out of Stuyvesant Town and Peter Cooper Village, about 8,000 people using that stop um, uh, in, you know, in the peak periods. Uh, I also assume that uh, it's a much higher number when adding folks from uh, points further east and south. Do you, do you know the, n the numbers of people who board the, uh, the L train at 14th and 1st in, in the morning rush? Give me, you know, if there's an average number, an 8 o'clock in the morning number, 7.30 in the morning number. I, I don't have the peak. It's the all day is 23,000 entering in that station. Um, I, we can get you the peak hour. Okay. So, um, all right, we'd like to know the answer to that. Um, and really what, uh, and, I'll, and I'll spare you all of the questions to get to the point, which is, do you have in your plan enough capacity to be able to accommodate uh, people who are getting on the bus heading westbound at 14th Street and 1st Avenue in a way that it is uh, sufficient that um, people will not watch bus after bus that is full passing them by. And if you could explain how you know that to be the case, that really is, uh, and I'll, I'll spare everybody the time and all the questions, but that's really what I'm interested in. And we can follow up with further details, but just before talking the specifics, the idea would be not to have every bus that comes out of the ferry cove um, be full before it got to First Avenue at 14th Street. And so whether that means that we stage buses and not run every bus from the Ferry Cove with customers and start some buses at First Avenue, I think there's still the opportunity to make some of those. There definitely is the opportunity to make more of those plan adjustments. And that was the discussion that we were having next to the board at, before the hearing began. Okay. And the, and the number of people that you plan to come in off of the ferry per hour is how many? The, the peak capacity is about 1,200 per hour. It's 150 per boat. Okay, 1,200 per hour. And how many uh, people can you fit on a bus that you expect to be running from the cove? It's about uh, 60. These are our techs, so six, 60 to 80 per bus total. So, uh, again, we, we wouldn't completely fill them up at that, at that stop, and we absolutely need to make sure that the, the, the other big stop is going to be First Avenue, clearly, and we need to have the capacity there. I'm sorry, the other, say, I, the, I couldn't the, go. The, the major stop on this route, the major boarding stop, will be First Avenue, 14th Street, and that's absolutely the, the stop that we intend to, to make sure there's capacity to serve. Um, all right. Uh, well, we'd like to follow up with you. Uh, I would actually like to ask that you follow up with me with those numbers. Um, and uh, thank you, Chairman, uh, and we'll look forward to speaking Blanche. with you about this yeah. further. Thank you. Okay, I should have been clear. I apologize. I hope everyone's listening. I am not advocating for more cars. I want less people to drive in Manhattan. I support congestion pricing. I support disincentivizing cars from coming into Manhattan. And I'm glad that our great transportation commissioner is going to tell people, don't drive into Manhattan. But for me, what I was trying to get at earlier is I don't think that presents a full solution to the impacts that I'm concerned about. And the impacts that I'm concerned about are not impacts on drivers. The impacts that I'm concerned about are impacts on pedestrians, cyclists, local residents who walk and don't use cars. I apologize if I was not clear in my line of questioning earlier uh, that uh, was, is what I was trying to get at. So for me, the issue here is I feel like we are trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. And what I mean by that is 
congestion is probably the biggest local day-to-day -day congestion and homelessness are the two biggest local day-to-day -day quality of life concerns that exist in my district on Crosstown streets, on Crosstown thoroughfares, on Uptown and Downtown avenues, on the West Side Highway, and in overcrowded uh, subway trains. So that is the biggest issue for me. The concern that I have is what are we doing, and someone on Twitter just sent me a study from Seoul and San Francisco on if you do these type of things, actually more cars don't show up because they realize they change their patterns and uh, their behavior. They decide they're not going to drive into the city. I haven't seen that data. This is the first time I've seen it. And so my concern here is if that doesn't come to pass, if people actually do continue to drive into Manhattan and drive into this district and 14th Street is closed off to vehicular traffic, how does that impact these side streets? I guess I wasn't clear earlier with my line of questioning, but that is what I'm getting at, and that is what I'd like to understand more. And someone sent me a, a study, which maybe DOT knows about from other municipalities around the world, that bear that out, but I would love to hear a little bit about that. So s since you went back to pedestrians and cyclists, let, let's just take that back, because you know we recognize in addition to vehicular congestion, of course, lower Manhattan has, is very full of pedestrians and cyclists as well. And that's why I do want to again mention, I think what we're proposing to do on 13th Street, it will be you know, a very robust east-west protected bike lane. You know, our which first, I support and think right, is great. Which is going to be our first one across town, and, and frankly, we hope we'll follow it with others. Um, they're not easy to put in, and there, there's been a lot of discussion about it. Likewise, just to emphasize, we're adding 50,000 square feet of pedestrian space on 14th Street, because we know that those 50,000 travelers that were formerly on the L train, a lot of them will be up on the street. They'll be catching buses. Some of them may be walking between subway stops. So, you know, we are focused on accommodating that growth. On the vehicular side, I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're starting with the proposal of HOV on Williamsburg Bridge. I think we'll be taking a look at other things. This is, you know, you were saying your constituents' congestion and homelessness are on the top of their list. I would say for, for many of your colleagues, congestion is up there on the list. And so it is a challenging, challenging thing to manage in a city that is now over 8.5 million people and, and booming economically. And the, the average, you know, each one of us in the council represent 170,000 residents who live in our district. The average daily population, and I'm not even talking about people in cars, I'm talking about people outside of cars that are in my council district from Canal Street up to 63rd Street, from Fifth Avenue to the Hudson River, with Penn Station, Moynihan Station, Times Square, the Broadway Theaters, the Javits Center, the Port Authority Bus Terminal, the High Line, the Whitney Museum, and all the other incredible, wonderful things that are in my district is 2.2 million people. So 2.2 million people are moving through this district, not that we're in right now, but my district every single day. And what does that cause? That causes congestion on sidewalks, that causes uh, congestion uh, of people just trying to get around. That is my concern here. My concern here is if we are diverting cars off of 14th Street, the other side streets that right now have traffic on them will be significantly worse, the blocks will be blocked for, the, the box will be blocked for pedestrians on some of these side streets now, the crosstown bike lanes, like on 15th Street, which is not a protected bike lane, will have double parked cars on it, so it's harder for cyclists to get through. So that is why I am asking these questions. It's not about protecting uh, car drivers. It's not about protecting vehicles. It is what will the impact be locally for all the other blocks in the vicinity of 14th Street. And I still would ask to see the data and to understand other municipalities or even other places in the city that have done this, what is the impact? We're, we're, we're happy to share the data. You know, I will just, I think, sort of close by saying I think this closure of the L train is, it's pretty unprecedented. I mean, you know, our agency, and, and we work closely with MTA, NYPD, sister agencies, to manage the congestion in this, the city on a day-to-day -day basis. And there's no question, as, as I recall from the town hall meeting in your district, your district is unique. The volume of commuters, the, the size of the transportation facilities. I mean, you, you, uh, I certainly recognize very special challenges in your district, and, and you and I have talked frequently about the, the frustrations you see there day-to-day. You know, I just have to add on top of that, unfortunately, the, this, this L-Tain shutdown, it's, it's, it's not something I think we've really had a precedent in. So it is going to take, I think, you know, 
all hands on deck. There, there is going to be, as I said in my testimony, some, some shared pain here for everybody. But we will get you the data. We will, you know, we are open to all creative solutions. Believe me, I, I recognize in your district in particular, on a good day, congestion is a tremendous problem, not only on roadways, but in the subways, in the buses, and on the sidewalks. And I don't ask you this as a gotcha question, Commissioner, at all. I know that, of course, you as Commissioner work for the mayor, and you're appointed by the mayor, and I respect that, so I'm not saying this in a gotcha way. I know the mayor is not sold on congestion pricing, and of course he supports a millionaire's tax, which would put more money into the MTA, into rapid bus transit, and then other things that are really important for the vast majority of folks in New York City that use our public transport transportation system. But for me, I sort of feel like until we deal with congestion, until we disincentivize cars from coming into Manhattan, we can try any mitigation plan we want. We can come up with the best, uh, most thoughtfully engineered plans. But until we actually disincentivize cars from coming below 96th Street into Manhattan, everything we do, and I don't say this in a negative way about the, the work that your team has done, who have spent years working on coming up with a full plan on this, it feels to me like tinkering around the edges. And I'm not saying you guys are just trying to tinker around the edges, but until we deal with the elephant in the room, which is there are too many cars coming into Manhattan, and until we do something to drastically disincentivize that, we're gonna keep spinning our wheels on figuring out ways to try to lessen the impact on pedestrians, small businesses, cyclists, uh, you have delivery trucks, as I talked about earlier, and, and I feel like all these other things are not big things that are going to move the needle in a significant way. I'm not saying that congestion pricing is the silver bullet, but I think that it is probably one of the bigger things that would help alleviate all the things we're talking about and all the things we're trying to deal with as it relates to an L train shutdown. So just, just a couple of thoughts on that. I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, which is I actually think we're trying to propose some, some pretty big things here. I, I'm not going to pretend they're going to solve congestion on the island of Manhattan. That, that wouldn't be real. And look, the, the mayor's made his views known, but as we know, the governor has appointed a commission. You know, we understand that they've been meeting. They've been looking at different potential scenarios, and my understanding is that they will produce a report with recommendations uh, towards the end of the year. So. We will have some ideas on the table from the governor and his panel, and I think give us all a chance to react and see how, look, I'm, I'm hoping they might produce some things that will help us with what we're facing here. I, I, I for one, would be, would be very happy if that were the case. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, and to close, uh, adding what uh, uh, Council Member Johnson said, you know, everyone knows that most New Yorkers rely on public transportation, that only 1.4 million New Yorkers own vehicle. Uh, from the 8.5, and as we know, everyone I think is working 24/7 to improve our transportation system, which is like one of those also uh, systems in the nation that work 24 hours that cover most of the neighborhood. But we understand that transportation deserts is real; that there's places in the Bronx, in Queens, in Brooklyn, where a teacher had to walk 10 blocks from the train station to the school where they teach. And I believe that during those years of construction of the air train, we should, as I said before, think outside the boxes on how can we learn from the bus services in that area so that we keep expanding those. And I think that, again, buses are running too slow in many areas. Enforcement is needed. Uh, we need to do more BRT. SBS, and, and, and those things are critical. So my, one of my, la my last thing is on our responsibility from the city governments and the state government is to look at what will be the services provided in that area that will replace the train services, the air train services. I believe, I, I will assume, right, that we agree that both services Ferry and bike are like the three of the most important services that we had to add and expand in that area. And I would add the subway system. Yeah, exactly. But besides expanding services in the other uh, 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 trains line, 
close to that area, but when it comes when it comes to that area that the L train cover, ferry, bus, and bike lane are going to be very critical, right? Is there a possibility to integrate the payment the payment system? And of course, I heard from you you talking on the ferry, but is the because that's the vision that's the New York City that I would like to see 10, 20 years from now. What we use where the cyclists and the, the pedestrians, New Yorkers can say, mm -hmm. when we paid one time, that payment can allow to, for us to do transfer. Mm -hmm. So since those three, the bus services, the bike lane, and, and the ferry will be very critical, mm -hmm. the centers of services that we need to replace, bring there to replace it, can we work together? Is there any hope, again, that you look for integrating and creating an integrating payment system, including those three services. So we have recently awarded a contract for a new fair payment system that will be the next technology to replace the MetroCard system. And it's in that context where there probably are greater opportunities to use technology, whether it's a phone payment system or a and a uh, credit card enabled, chi a chip enabled credit card or some other um, mechanism. But as I said earlier, I think that is a separate conversation and one we would participate in. I, I just hope that, and, I, and again, in this, first of all, thank you for being here. Thank you for your time, uh, answering all the questions, and your commitment to continue going through all those communities, responding all the questions. And as I said, you can always have strong opinions, and we need to be ready to respond, answer all those questions. But my concern is that, yes, we will have the ferry, we have the bus services, we have the city bike, but we, up to now, we're expecting that those New Yorkers, they will be doing three different payments. You know, that there's not a, right now, as you know, I know, I know that you are working to, for the new payment system, but are, do we have that concern that with the closure of the L train, those three services that we will provide or expand it will come of those riders to do three different payments for those three di different services. While I, I um, continue to say, you know, our fair, our fair policy and our fair structure around the alternate service plans that will be required for the L are still evolving. I do think that there is the possibility that at the ferry, as using that as an example, somebody will come up and right now there is the ability to pay for the ferry and get a receipt, and that receipt could then easily be the fair payment mechanism for the free transfer onto the SBS bus on the other side of the river. So I think there are opportunities. We just need to continue the, okay. the dialogue. I just hope that you look at it. First of all, I'm happy to hear that. And I also let you think also look at how city bike can be part of that plan for those tunnel construction to also receive or anything that, you know, in the same payment for the city bike to be able to also to use a bus and to use a ferry too. With that, thank you and happy holiday. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. We're going to be taking five minutes break so that we will continue with the three panels that we have.
break. The next panel will be composed by Eric McClure, a Manhattan Board President, Representative by Shula Warren, Chris Leonard, Emily Provencal, and Kate Slevin. Everyone will have the opportunity to have two minutes to present the testimony. If it's longer than that, please summarize. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. My name is Eric McClure. I am the Executive Director of Streets PAC. While the plan released yesterday by the MTA and New York City Department of Transportation is a significant step forward in addressing the transportation crisis that will be created by the 15-month shutdown of the Canarsie tubes beginning in 2019, it does need to go further. Our hope is that this is merely an opening bid that will be, re be revised and made stronger over the coming months. For starters, we believe that buses running across the Williamsburg Bridge should have a dedicated, physically separated lane discreet from trucks and turning cars. In order to move 70 buses with 3,800 passengers per hour across the bridge, they must be able to travel unencumbered by other vehicles. In addition, the bus approaches to the bridge must be dedicated and protected. While HOV3 plus restrictions are absolutely necessary, we have deep concerns about enforceability of those restrictions and would like to see a detailed enforcement plan. Furthermore, we believe that occupancy restrictions on the bridge should be in place 24 hours, seven days a week, as commuting patterns and timing will likely evolve during the shutdown. The same is true for bus-only restrictions on the 14th Street core busway, which should be extended well beyond rush hours. We are certain to see major increases in for higher vehicle traffic along the affected route, the effects of which will only be mitigated by dedicating space for much more efficient buses. We also need to better understand how bus loading and especially unloading will work. During peak traffic of 70 buses per hour, the potential for bottlenecks caused by passenger entrance and egress will be high. Will bus stops be extending along the route? Will bus stops be extended along the route? What accommodations will be in place to speed passenger movement? This is an important detail. The added ferry service and enhanced biking infrastructure outlined in the plan will help around the margins. However, we have deep concerns about the ability of the G, J, M, and Z lines to absorb the 160,000 to 180,000 displaced regular L riders that the MTA and NYC DOT expect on those routes. While extending G trains and more frequent service will help, we will will new tr free, free transfers and station as will f new free transfers and station enhancements we're skeptical about the ability of existing east river subways to fully accommodate the extra passengers in case anyone hasn't noticed the subway system hasn't been working terribly well lately without the huge added challenge of the l shutdown speaking of station enhancements the mta should take this opportunity to make all stations affected by the shutdown ada compliant to do so, to not do so is a big missed opportunity we applaud what seems like a pretty significant plan for public outreach and engagement, which is critical. The shutdown of the L is going to cause significant hardship for many people for an extended period of time, and giving affected riders plenty of opportunity to weigh in and vent will help ease the pain. And finally, the effects of the L shutdown would be additionally mitigated if we were to have a congestion pricing plan in place. That needs to happen, and soon. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Kate Slevin, Vice President of State Programs and Advocacy at Regional Plan Association, an organization that works to improve mobility, economic opportunity, and sustainability in the New York City metropolitan region. Thank you to the Chairman and his colleagues for holding this hearing today. The closure plans released by New York City DOT and MTA are a good starting point for discussion that we expect will continue for several months. RPA broadly supports the concepts in their proposal, but we hope they can become bolder in the weeks and months ahead. The MTA and DOT must seize this opportunity to create transformative change, providing lasting benefits both above and below ground. While we are still reviewing their plans released yesterday, we have some preliminary comments today. We thank the DOT for putting forth a new street design for a busway across 14th Street, but still have questions about how um, to ensure the buses don't get stuck behind trucks making deliveries whether there will be delivery windows um, for trucks um, at certain times a day and allowing the buses to run um, without being stuck behind the trucks throughout um, other periods. We hope the agencies will take advantage of this dedicated space by making it long, more of the day, so allowing buses to run 
um, on, and having the busway be more than just the peak hours during the day. And we hope they'll work with the NYPD on proper enforcement and by running buses from Brook Brooklyn directly along 14th Street, so not having them all stop at uh, Delancey, Delancey or Bleecker Street. We hope that the DOT will take a hard look at bus access to the Williamsburg Bridge, as the plans presented do not convince us that the bridge will have free-flowing access. Um, and this is vitally important to keep bus, bus riders moving. Also, it's clear that HOV restrictions beyond dr just rush hours and at other crossings in the East River are necessary and should be considered. And of course, we've strongly supported congestion pricing and continue to do so. We support the free MetroCard transfers and ask the MCDA to do more with fares. They should implement new contactless fare payment system for buses during the closure and reduce Long Island Railroad fares for trips within New York City. This can be done by implementing the so-called freedom ticket discount for Long Island Railroad trips between Jamaica and Atlantic Avenue. Discounted fares would better connect people to their jobs because our analysis shows that downtown Brooklyn is a key employment hub for people who live along the L line. Um, the MTA seems to be expanding its capital improvements plans for the closed stations, and we support that, and we hope they'll continue to do more. This means in adding new elevators at 3rd and 6th Avenues, continuing to improve circulation elements at Union Square, and eventually track and terminal improvements to 8th Avenue that will allow more service to run um, on the L train in the future. Um, we long, we uh, support the longer-term shutdowns that the MTA is consider considering um, because we think this can save time and money um, and improve our subways faster. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Rodriguez and members of the Transportation Committee. My name is Chris Leonard, Vice President of Membership at the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce. And I am delivering testimony on behalf of Andrew Hohen, President and CEO of the Brooklyn Chamber. With over 2,000 active members, the Brooklyn Chamber is the largest and number one ranked chamber in New York State. We promote economic development across the borough of Brooklyn as well as advocate on behalf of member businesses. From Canarsie to Bushwick to Williamsburg, L train ridership is diverse and dependent on the L train to get to work, school, and doctor's appointments. In addition, the local businesses along the L train are at risk since they are heavily dependent on it to maintain brisk foot traffic. Earlier this year, the Brooklyn Chamber collaborated with the North Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce to conduct a small survey of businesses along the L train in North Brooklyn to gauge how they may be impacted by the shutdown. According to this survey, 40% of the businesses expected a loss of up to 50% of revenue. In addition, 75% mentioned that their employees rely on the L train to get to their, place to, to their place of work. So we recommend the following to mitigate the impacts of the L train closure for these small businesses. Uh, provide tax incentives or relief that will help Brooklyn businesses keep up with the already high operational costs of the f uh, in face of the potential decreased uh, sales. Um, additional cars on both the elevated and non-elevated lines, including the JMZ, which you've already addressed today. Additional electric buses, which we've already addressed. Um, and especially funding for an ombudsman for small businesses services along the L train route. Uh, the Brooklyn Chamber also supports Resolution 1443 aimed at reducing the risk of increased pollution, especially in areas that already have unusually high uh, or, or poor air quality. Uh, during the 15-month shutdown of the L train, there will be significant increase in car and bus traffic, during which, which will generate higher carbon emissions in neighborhoods along the L line. Uh, this will undoubtedly put the more than 200,000 daily commuters at risk of developing or making worse uh, health conditions, such as asthma. Uh, the resolution represents a responsible approach to protecting the health of residents by transitioning to electric buses during the shutdown so as not to already exacerbate a already challenging situation. Um, on behalf of the members of the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce, thanks for the opportunity to testify. Uh, I've summarized our statement, so there's more to read, which you have right in front of you. Uh, thank you so much, Chair Rodriguez and members of the Transportation Committee. Thank you, and I would like to acknowledge also for record that we have testimony from Manhattan Borough President Gabe Brewer and from the Tri-State Transportation com uh, Campaign. Thanks. Thank and also from New York City, uh, Elizabeth Winship from Ettinger, I'm sorry, Elizabeth Winship. The next panel will be Steve Fabricant, Kat Fisher, Karen Cornelio. Bernadette Reynolds, Phil 
Voz, Marisa Silva Faro. So let me call the next one, if, which is the last one, Peter Walters, Pill, Adam Lerman, Elizabeth Winship, and Stephen Bauman. If I did not call anybody else, please be sure. Whoever I call sit in the table. That's, is it first? I, everyone fix their things. You may begin. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is Peter Walderspiel. I, uh, I represent Stytown, Peter Cooper Village, uh, and Congressman in uh, Council Members Gorotnik District. Um, the numbers don't add up for us, quite frankly, although we're thankful that we finally had a mitigation plan presented today. It was a little bit of a shame that it took a hearing to do so. We have 28,000 people resident, uh, residents living in Stytown, of which about 18,000 are part of a commuting population. 8,200 of these use the L train on a daily basis. That's 16% of the within Manhattan ridership of the L train. If we now add a couple of thousand people that live in the East Village to this, we're at 30% of daily riders, and now with the new ferry stop, we add another 10,000 riders. So we're basically at 50% of the daily existing Manhattan ridership that has to be transported in a different manner. That's 25,000 people. The ferry alone, as we were told, adds 1,200 individuals per hour. With a bus that holds about 60 people, if it's full, that's 17 buses just for the ferry passengers per hour. I wonder where those other 15,000 people will find room even on a bus that will have to cross 14th Street. The other thing that is a little bit disturbing, as we can see here to me, is that the bus way doesn't start until 3rd Avenue. So anyone who gets on the bus at the ferry stop all the way to 3rd Avenue has to contend with other traffic on 14th Street, um, be that cabs, individual cars, trucks making deliveries, um, and even though we have bus lanes, I think we all know that bus lanes are a perfect stop for uh, rideshare vehicles and cabs to simply pull over, turn on their flashers, and load and discharge passengers. In the meantime, there are buses trying to get by. So I think this plan does not go far enough as presented. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Thank you and to the committee also for this opportunity to testify on behalf of Energy Vision, a New York City-based nonprofit environmental organization. My name is Phil Voss. Through public education, research, and analysis, Energy Vision advocates for the use of non-petroleum, low-carbon transportation fuels, particularly for heavy-duty vehicles like trucks and buses. Energy Vision has become recognized nationally and internationally as a leading independent expert on alternative fuels for heavy fleets. Electric shuttle buses are clearly part of the L-Train shutdown conversation. And while vehicle electrification will no doubt, no doubt play an important role, I want to look at an additional emerging low carbon technology that is already being used by thousands of heavy vehicles in American fleets. It is deployable in New York City now in vehicles that are already on the road and using fueling infrastructure that is already in place. That technology is organic waste derived biomethane, sometimes called renewable natural gas. Many people are familiar with the idea of landfill gas. The same kind of methane rich gas is captured around the country at wastewater treatment plants and in purpose built anaerobic digesters. All this gas can be refined to pipeline quality biomethane and used just like geologic natural gas, including as vehicle fuel. But the greenhouse gas emissions from bi biomethane are 40% or more lower than from geologic natural gas and 70% or more lower than from diesel fuel. Such a fuel could help New York City move rapidly towards its 80 by 50 greenhouse gas emissions reduction goals. 
At least 800 MTA buses use, comp use compressed natural gas as fuel. Biomethane, which is available on the market, can be used in any natural gas vehicle with no modification and can be transported and dispensed using existing infrastructure. With the change in procurement practices, MTA buses could switch over to biomethane, immediately reducing their emissions by 40% or more. The L train shutdown represents an opportunity to pilot biomethane and surface transit in New York City. The Spring Creek Bus Depot on Flatlands Avenue near the L train terminus at Rockaway Parkway houses natural gas buses now. If buses from that depot served as L train shuttles and that depot converted to biomethane, even on a trial basis, it would allow MTA to become the first New York fleet to utilize this ultra low emission solution. Biomethane is also a closed loop solution for New York City with appropriate investment and building on existing infrastructure, our own huge waste streams could be converted to vehicle fuel. The fuel is a proven solution that is available now and it's ready to be deployed in New York City. We encourage the MTA and the committee to consider piloting its introduction as part of the L-Train shutdown. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And we definitely will be following, so for following your recommendations as the other members of the panel. Good afternoon, Chairperson Nidanis Rodriguez and members of the City Council. My name is Renee Reynolds and I'm here to testify on behalf of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. Founded in 1991, NIJA is a nonprofit citywide membership network linking grassroots organizations from low income neighborhoods and communities of color in their struggle for environmental justice. NIJA empowers its member organizations to advocate for improved environmental conditions and against an equitable environmental burdens. Through our efforts, member co organizations coalesce around specific common issues that threaten the ability of low-income communities and communities of color to thrive and coordinate campaigns designed to affect city and state policies, including transportation policies that affect their communities. I'd like to thank Council Member Rafael Espinal for sponsoring the resolution calling on Governor Cuomo and the MTA to commit to an expeditious transition from fossil fuel burning diesel buses to a modern electric bus fleet. Communities in North Brooklyn are overburdened by heavy vehicle traffic and their emissions. When compared to the rest of Brooklyn and New York City as a whole, the neighborhoods of Williamsburg and Bushwick fare worse in asthma hospitalization rates across all age groups. And overall increases in asthma prevalence are contributing to growing health care costs for New York employers, consumers, and taxpayers. In 2016, we conducted a community survey in partnership with our member organization, El Puente, and found that in certain intersections in North Brooklyn, over 200 bus, um, trucks converge across um, uh, intersections in a one-hour period. We think that the 2019 shutdown of the L train represents an opportunity to act intentionally in deriving a replacement strategy that would fill the gaps in transit service and also play a part in a longer term strategy for reducing vehicle emissions in the city. The city could save on mass transit exp uh, expenditures while cleaning the air that we breathe, reducing oil consumption and re reducing the amount of greenhouse gas emissions. The MTA operates 5,700 5, buses and should be a standard bearer for the United States. They should look at the examples from other cities across the country and move towards creating transportation options that improve health benefits um, for our communities rather than worsen them. Thank you. I, I would like also to acknowledge that Council Member Rose is here as we will continue listen, listening to the other members of the panel. Uh, thank you. Thank you to the uh, um, Chairman uh, Rodriguez and to Council Member Espinal who uh, um, has pushed this uh, resolution into being with us and for all those who co-sponsored. Um, so I'm Kat Fisher from the Sierra Club and I lead the electric vehicle program in New York State. And um, we are thrilled that we have so many allies here today. We had several members who've had to leave. New York City, as you know, is rated among the top 25 most polluted cities in the American Lung Association's State of the Air report. More than two million people in the New York metropolitan area have asthma, including nearing, uh, nearly half a million children. 
Um, we say, why go with low emissions when we can go with no emissions? And with, with respect to the MTA um, statement today about being cautious or wise about their investment, when you can save $39,000 a year per bus with electric buses, as their own Columbia feasibility study proved, we think that there's a lot of savings to be had, not only through fuel and through maintenance, but uh, through, uh, obviously through emissions as well. And uh, not to mention, with electric buses, we're preventing further storm damage to uh, subway tunnels like the L train. Uh, electric buses, whose production was ramped up significantly as a global response to climate disruption, have come down in price by hundreds of thousands in, uh, of dollars each year and now offer the lowest total cost of ownership. Life cycle global warming emissions from battery electric buses are more than 70% lower than those from fracked gas or diesel, according to the Union of Concerned Scientists. This transition also needs to be a just one that includes the retraining of current New York workers. And cities like Los Angeles, Seattle, Worcester, Massachusetts, and Philadelphia, and countless cold weather cities in Europe have already made the commitment to zero emission buses. The MTA's current electric bus pilot is not its first. In a fleet of 5,700, a 1% bus pilot for three years is too small and doesn't go far enough. We need a shorter pilot and bigger commitments. The Sierra Club is calling on the state's largest transit agency to make a serious and speedy switch to an electric fleet. Uh, Superstorm Sandy, which cost New York businesses billions in damages of, and lost revenue, showed us just how vulnerable our communities are to the effects of climate disruption, and our transportation sector is a crucial part of the solution. That's why over 100 New York City business owners in Brooklyn and the Bronx signed on to a letter of support to a switch for clean electric buses. Extracting and burning oil creates more than 40% of the climate uh, disrupting emissions in the U.S., and for those of us who believe in climate change, we have to summon the courage to acknowledge the urgency of the situation. The urgency of key transition like zero emission transit stems from the fact that from the inertia of our climate system, it doesn't respond quickly to change. With a two and a half mile deep ocean and almost two mile thick ice sheets, it takes a long time for the changes we make today to take effect. Electric buses are a crucial piece of the solution and we don't have time to wait. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Jessica Kiaslan, and I'm the strategic researcher at Align, the Alliance for a Greater New York, and I'm testifying on behalf of my executive director, Maritza Silva Farrell. Align is a long-standing alliance of labor and community and environmental justice organizations united for a just and sustainable New York. Our vision for the future pr uh, prioritizes investment in sustainable energy, the creation of career track jobs in green industries, and ensuring the health and welfare of every neighborhood, particularly low-income communities and communities of color that are disproportionately affected by climate change. Resolution 1443 will help ensure the sustainability of our environment as well as our communities. The neighborhoods that rely on the L train should not have to deal with more dirty buses clogging their streets on top of service disruptions that are a result of chronic underfunding. A cleaner electric buses are quieter and generate far less emissions than diesel buses. This means cleaner air for pedestrians, bus riders, and bus drivers. Our, researchers, our research with community groups in Bushwick found particulate matter was up to five times higher than the average for North Brooklyn. An all-electric fleet would help alleviate these harmful pollutants from threatening the health of our communities. At Align, we believe electrifying the L-Train shuttle fleet uh, is a step in the right direction. However, a full transition to an entirely electric fleet of all buses on our streets, including MTA as well as school buses, will ensure a significantly cleaner future for our communities and keep New York on track to meet the mayor's goal of reducing emissions by 40% by 2030. A fully electric MTA bus fleet would save New York City over 575,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent a year. Electrifying bu bus fleets should also, excuse me, also provides an economic opportunity for the city to generate jobs while also saving money. Electric charging stations for the buses open up a new sector of jobs in green energy. These jobs can be career track jobs that build skills and prioritize hiring from low-income communities and communities of color. In addition to generating more jobs, the city will save money over the life of an all-electric fleet compared to their fleet. When considering upfront costs, fuel costs, and maintenance costs, electric buses cost just under 40K less annually than diesel-powered buses. 
Considering the health benefits for workers and community members, the economic opportunity to expand job sectors, and the sustained cost savings, it's clear that an all-electric bus fleet provides us an opportunity to achieve both a more sustainable future as well as a healthier economy and environment for all New Yorkers. Thank you. My name, <clears throat> my name is Stephen Bauman. I'm here as a private citizen. Dwight Eisenhower developed the uh, war operations plans over three months' time in 1942. Uh, the closure has been on, has uh, came about, was first presented in January of 2016. Uh, the operations plans from the MTA have taken 23 months. That puts them 20 months behind Eisenhower's uh, pace. Uh, presently, with regard to the uh, impact of the shutdown, uh, the, the uh, service in Brooklyn is going to be reduced by 62.5 percent. This was not mentioned in the report. It will make a big impact on the people who use only the L train in Brooklyn. That's 125,000 people. Right now, there are 20, the L train operates 20 uh, trains uh, going between Brooklyn and Manhattan during the peak hour. They hope that 20 percent of the people will avoid the L train for the duration. That still leaves 16 trainloads of passengers to be uh, shuttled to uh, – 16 trainloads need to be uh, added to the schedules on various routes. The promised G train service increase doesn't count because the G train does not go into Manhattan. The proposed transfer points are uh, at uh, – to the number three and number seven won't help either because no additional trains are possible on these two routes. The only additional proposal has been increase the JM, JM and Z uh, lines. The total amount that they can have on there is eight trains. The constraints are limited by traffic on the uh, F and M line existing and also weight constraints on the Williamsburg Bridge. That means eight out of the 16 trains are the only ones that are going to happen. That's a 50 percent solution at best with regard to this thing. Take a look at other uh, infrastructure replacements. Hudson River t tunnels, what they're going to do is put, build a new tunnel and then uh, repair the existing ones. Ditto for the uh, bridges, the Kosciuszko Bridge, the Mario Cuomo Bridge, and so forth. Uh, 200,000 people use the Hudson River tunnels. Uh, 180,000 vehicles use the Kosciuszko, 79,000 use the Gothels, and 140,000 use the uh, Mario Cuomo Bridge versus 265,000 for the uh, Canarsie Tunnels. Those are clearly the number of people adversely affected isn't what drives the decision to avoid closure. Who the people are and where they live plays an important point. Approximately 400,000 people will be affected if for an average of 30 minutes per trip, the total cost to them at minimum wage over the 15 months is $1.15 billion. That's the cost that the public will have to pay for this closure. In addition to the money, what that means is for that money plus the uh, amount of money that the businesses will suffer would have paid for an additional tunnel and would have avoided the entire closure problem. Uh, one big difference is after this money has been spent, for the Hudson River Tunnels or the Cuomo Bridge, they come up with better infrastructure. What we will have left is something that is no better than what uh, the Canarsie Tunnel was before right. Sandy occurred. Thank you. We have one more person. Uh, good afternoon. Sorry. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. I'm here to speak on behalf of electric buses. My name is Steve Fabrican. I'm a New Yorker and bus and subway rider. I've been involved with the Sierra Club EV initiative through CAT Fisher for the last few years. Uh, I have been driving an electric BMW i3 and love it. For those that have never been in an EV or been behind the steering wheel, I, I highly recommend it. Not only is it a quiet, not only is it a quiet, less stressful ride, much needed and noise in New York City, I know I'm not spewing awful fumes into the, air, uh, into the air. A few months ago, I got to see an electric bus being showcased at a Sierra Club meeting right here in Midtown Manhattan as part of the annual National Drive Electric Week in September. 
Even though the bus didn't move from its location, I got to tour it inside. It was an awfully hot day, and the bus's air conditioning was totally powered, nice and cold like we New Yorkers love it. I realized the bus was idling and not spewing awful carbon dioxide into the air. It made me think of all the stop buses made to pick up and drop off passengers, all those fumes. Electric buses will keep the city quieter and cleaner. And as a progressive city and state, New York, we need electric buses. Not only will the customers be educated about New York City being progressive, they will love the clean and quiet experience electric buses will bring to our city. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Adam Lerman, and I, I live here, and I'm a person. Um, so a lot of the points that I was going to make have already been made. I don't need to bother you with redundancy, but I want to bring up two very specific points, one uh, uh, local slash economic and one personal. The first is essentially um, the, the, the local issue. A 2016 study, as we've heard, and many other studies have talked about the effects, uh, the asthma uh, issues that we, we have in this city. Um, and I want to bring up a specific economic point. Uh, as we know, the state co-funds Medicaid, uh, providing a significant amount of funding for the poor and elderly who are suffering from such issues as these respiratory ailments. This funding is derived uh, from general tax revenues, i.e. the taxpayer, which means that if we don't make a change now to the causes of these respiratory uh, ailments, we, the taxpayers, are going to have to pay even more, especially if Congress's proposed tax plan is enacted and New York finds itself getting hit with across-the-board tax increases that many Democratic states in this country are about to endure. Electric buses, in, in very simple summary, decrease emissions, which decrease asthma-related illnesses, which decreases Medicaid responsibilities on the state and taxpayer, Everybody wins. The personal issue is this. I'm the father of a two-year-old. Um, I'm about to have a second one in a month. Uh, I live in an area, a building. There are four apartments that look out on a bus stop. A lot of these newborns and young toddlers have windows that are facing the street, and we simply can't cross-ventilate by you know, saving electricity and thus the environment with air conditioners. We can't cross-ventilate uh, using windows because as these windows sit out and look at these buses passing by, we are seeing, as we all understand, and we've all seen a million times, that black particulate that forms on the window cells. That's the kind of thing that lands in our rooms and on the lungs of our children. Idling buses are not the only uh, uh, causes of this particulate, but they are a major contributor. And the idea of the MTA and the DOT saying that New York is a unique city and uh, using that kind of uh, cheeky non-excuse for uh, uh, pursuing a 100% electric fleet is not only irresponsible but absurd because this is a not, not a, an idea that needs to be pilot tested because you don't need to, to test a proven theory. Let us, as, as you had mentioned, consider and test immediately an electric bus fleet and recognize, as has been mentioned, the incredible economic incentives of, re, of reorganizing our infrastructure to power a fully electric fleet, and not only the, the plausibility and the sustainability, but the inevitability of a completely electric fleet because in, in the mind, uh, mindset of uh, there are no jobs on a dead planet, we must completely eliminate any reliance on fossil fuels, and we have the opportunity to be, to be as we believe ourselves to be, the greatest city in the world, one of the greatest leaders in, in implementing this kind of philosophy into our infrastructure. Thank you. My colleague, uh, Councilman Espinar, has a question. I just, I'd love to um, get the Sierra Club's thoughts on um, the, MT, uh, the MTA's uh, testimony and their, and, and their view that um, there isn't enough data and that they have to run this pilot just to make sure that their money is being well invested and they're not purchasing buses that at some point cannot, be, cannot work in our city streets. Well, it's interesting that they did um, um, commission a study uh, by Columbia, the recommendation of which was uh, on electric buses, the recommendation of which was a one-year pilot and uh, so now they're in the midst of a three-year pilot, which we just think is excessive, and we wonder if they're waiting 
uh, on the universalization of charging because there isn't a universal uh, charging system right now for buses. But we see other cities um, making the plunge, and there are the manufacturers uh, of these buses also have all different kinds of contractual arrangements that would protect their investment. Uh, uh, not the manufacturers, but that would help the MTA to protect its investment and make sure that they don't get stuck, as, uh, as she mentioned. So I'm sure they have a warranty of some sort, if, if for some reason it doesn't work in New York City streets? Uh, there's really not an issue of it not working in New York <laughs> City streets. Um, so there have been four pilots. I mean, this, this would be the fourth pilot, but they're fully operational in, in, in other uh, cold cold weather cities, so I don't think it's really an issue. Are there any other comparable cities where we where they have more than 10 electric buses on, on the roads? Well, we know Chicago um, uh, has just purchased some, Philadelphia has, so in addition to um, Worcester, Massachusetts, which probably isn't comparable, it is weather-wise, but maybe not with the condition of their streets, um, there is data out there that, uh, and from, from Europe as well, that, that I'm sure that they must be um, uh, privy to. It's, do you agree that it's, it's, it would be wise for the MTA, instead of you know, using this capital, tax, our tax dollars, to invest on diesel buses instead of, oh, but do you think it would be smarter for the MTA to use our new tax dollars that they have towards electric buses when, we, when they're saying that they're going to pilot this program and hopefully in the future expand, just, just make that commitment up front instead of waiting and, and, and uh, waiting for this data to come You know, out. so what we're asked here to compare is the cost of the health of New Yorkers. So there is a risk. There's a risk every day in the lives of people who breathe this, of lung disease and heart disease and all the related illnesses to, to air quality, not to mention uh, uh, exacerbating future storms. So when they're talking about a financial risk, we're talking about a risk to human lives and to human health and to uh, you know more damage uh, to subway lines and to coastal cities like ours. So it really doesn't seem like a fair comparison to me. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. So with that, I, we're coming to the end of this hearing. Thank you for your testimony. And, you know, your voices are going to be very important as conversation will continue. I know that you will go also to those community meetings that the MTA and DOT, they will put together. I would personally like to invite you for now to be part of our third car-free day that we will be doing Sunday, April 22nd on Earth Day. Uh, last year, we were able to close Broadway from 44 to Union Square, and hopefully we'll be able to close similar area and dedicate a day to have a conversation about the importance for everyone to do their part to protect our Mother Earth. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to close again this hearing, first of all, expressing my support to Council Member Espinar resolution. I hope that we can be able to work with the rest of the colleagues and be able to pass this resolution before the end of the year. It, I will also repeat that the closure of the L train provides everyone an opportunity to do many pilot projects. One should be also to be able to centralize the payment system, to create an integrated payment system where with one payment, riders should be able to transfer from buses, uh, city bike, and ferry something that I also hope will be the future of transportation in New York City. I also believe that it is important as we are closing this year to be open for everyone to do their part to, to raise revenue to the MTA and for the MTA to open more the book and be more uh, transparent on how they are controlling the cost. I believe that the city should also be open to increase the contribution if those contribution is used for particular projects related to maintenance and repair. And finally, I hope that the MTA should be able to, to provide two or three additional seats to New York City at the board that is designated by the City Council and also for uh, the MTA to focus the next 10 year only in maintenance and repair. So that I hope that from 2018 to 2028, we should not get to see the MTA being involved in any new mega project by yet to complete and all work that they got to do related to maintenance and repair. With that, this hearing is adjourned. Be tuned since we, as a committee of transportation, we're going to be, we're going to be voting good bills before the end of this year. This hearing is adjourned. Appreciate it.